Coast. Good morning for those in US. Good afternoon or good evening to our colleagues in Europe and elsewhere. I'm Mac Makiewicz. It is again a pleasure to welcome you to our second day. Um, uh, before we uh, before we um, dive into science, let me uh, let me remind you uh, there are a couple of housekeeping uh, comments. Please use chat feature to ask presenters a question. Sorry, let me turn on my uh, video. Okay, that's fine. Uh, in order to minimize disruption, those who are not presenting do not have access to microphones or camera. If you have any technical question, please let uh, uh, Rao know. Uh, and speakers have 15 minutes and I will make a, a comment or I will interrupt two minutes before prior to the talk time. Uh, and the session will be followed by the panel discussion by guided by the presentation. And we encourage questions from the audience and scientific uh, writer is present in the call and we will have a, um, a, and the meeting is being recorded. And we ask all session chairs and presented to briefly introduce themselves. Again, the goal is of this workshop is to discuss whether microbial pathogens may represent a causal component of Alzheimer's disease. And we would like to review knowledge gaps and establish uh, scientific priorities to address uh, these gaps. And let me repeat what I just said today. We really value your opinion. We would like, and we would appreciate your comments in the chat box about the gaps and priorities and how to move uh, field forward. Again, there are hopes to, we hope to prepare a white paper from the workshop and your input would be invaluable. Um, there is a little bit confusion this morning. Uh, we originally assumed that Dr. Manolis uh, Kellis will not be able to present. So we rescheduled that um, our morning session. However, Dr. Kellis is now telling us that he will and, and is capable uh, to presenting. So we will have a brief presentation, one or two slides from Dr. Richard Latter from UK. And then we will try to accommodate Dr. Kelly's. We will perhaps shorten a little bit our break. So um, again, welcome again. Uh, and I guess uh, I'm assuming Dr. Uh, Adam Spira is online and um, and can take over. Adam. I am here. I am just getting organized. Hold on a sec. Uh, okay, Adam. So uh, since we again, since we have a little bit um, um, complication this morning, why don't we start with Dr. Latte, Dr. Latte, are you online? Yes, I'm. I'm here. Okay, it's ten o'clock or one minute before ten. Please go ahead with your brief presentation. Okay. Do you want me to connect to video? I. I assuming we have your slide and we can. Rao, can we show Dr. Latte's slide? Just as a note, um, I'm unable to connect to video as well. I don't know if you want the panelists to have that ability. I cannot commit, connect to video either, but uh, so at this point right. we will try to do without video. Okay. Right, well, let's, let's get started then. Um, yes, go ahead. Yeah, okay. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Richard Leith. I'm, I'm a professor in the Division of Infection Medicine at the University of Edinburgh. I only found out yesterday that I would be presenting today and I'm only allowed two slides. So I'm going to summarize unpublished data representing three years of work. And the question we're trying to answer is what is the true extent of the brain microbiome in health and disease? Right, so looking at the first slide, we developed a tree of life approach. Now on the right, you see the tree of life ranging from archaea, bacteria, 
through to holozoa including animalia top right and our approach was to devise 60 former probes based on ribosomal rna and i should say this is this is, this is incredibly computation intensive and this is work has involved more than 500 hours of computer time which is a lot but it's highly accurate and then on the left we've got a summary of, of four data banks including 31 control and 47 ad and if um ben reed heads around i'd like to thank him for helping reconstructing the the key mount sinai files and as you can see all classes are represented even archaea at the top right down to holozo at the bottom um, and at this level, you can't see any obvious differences between control and AD. Instead, we, we, we see rather consistent patterns in which specific bacteria, fungi, and chloroplastida, stroke algae, are represented. We've been able to get exact species identifications, but no time today to discuss these. I will say that these are, each of those matches, these are not monophyletic. These, are, these represent clusters of highly related species. Um, at the bottom for viruses, we based our analysis on Reed Hedadal and Neuron, whose method I think is possibly prone to false positives, but in our view is immune to false negatives. So we took the top 20 virus classes representing 99% of all reads and reanalyzed all the data sets. And we find that very few herpes viruses, although there's some, um, confirming yesterday's presentation by Steve uh, Jacobson, instead the major virus type is adenovirus C, which represents 83% of all reads. Um, and it's also a rather distinctive strain of adenovirus, which we see in different individuals. And the take home messages here basically are all classes are represented, particularly bacteria and fungi. Cellular microbes are far more abundant than viruses. And roughly one third of individuals have actually very few microbes in brain. But we'll come back to that. Now, if we get to the next slide. We get the next slide, please. Right. <clears throat> At the top, we've plotted cellular microbes versus viruses versus retro elements and endogenous retroviruses. As you can see, there's a strong correlation. Um, individuals or, or brain regions that have lots of cellular microbes also have more abundant viruses and also have um, retro elements, transcripts. And this, this isn't too surprising because stress of various types, including infection, is known to induce retro element mobilization. Um, now, below is um, a set of data from the Edinburgh Brain Bank. And this data set is slightly unusual because we looked at four different regions from the same individuals. Lower right, if you look right, you can see that um, cingulate cortex is the most extensively involved, followed by amygdala, hippocampus, and hypothalamus, but relatively few microbes in cortex. And I think this is an important finding because the vast majority of studies to date are focused on frontal cortex and related areas and could have ignored the, the, the um, overabundance in other brain areas. And I would stress though that we've not yet looked at other key regions. Um, and in particular, we're interested in locus cellulus, limbic thalamus and cholinergic nuclei. You remember the, the, the cholinergic hypothesis of Alzheimer's disease, and it could be some of these individuals have extensive microbe invasion there and this could potentially explain why some individuals have few microbes um, on the left is a more detailed analysis illustrating that some microbes sorry some individuals have microbes only in cellular cortex whereas others only have microbes in another brain region or regions and one interesting observation is that that some atypical microbes that are arrowed if you can see the arrows on the left there um, these are atypical microbes that are only present in that individual, um, but they seem to be present in more than one brain region. 
and that's suggestive of, of spreading in vivo. Um, now, in terms of interpretation, um, we believe that many of these microorganisms might actually be harmless, innocuous bystanders, by analogy with the, with the gut and, and the lung. Um, but whereas others might be um, highly pathogenic. And the big issue so far is whether any specific microbes are overabundant in AD brain. And we're working on this right now. But preliminary findings, uh, without going into detail, is that there are indeed some specific microbes that are highly abundant in Alzheimer's disease brain, but not in normal. Um, as a final thought, this, this type of analysis is very difficult for two reasons. First, the normal group is certain to contain many cases of pre or undiagnosed AD. And second, the AD group is likely to contain many cases that are not in fact AD. And if you look at the chart lower left, we, we looked at six AD patients, but post-mortem it turned out two of them who were diagnosed as Alzheimer's disease in life. Um, one was vascular dementia, the other one turned out to be Lewy body dementia. And that's a complication. And the major outstanding concern really is, are we looking at the right brain regions? The individuals with seemingly low microbe counts could have very high abundances in one of the other regions we have not looked at, and we're hoping to explore that. So to finish, I'd like to thank Alison Daniels and Sylvia Hugh, two students who've been working on the project for all the hard work, and I'd like to thank the Benta Foundation for funding this research. So that's the end of my presentation. Thank, thank you, you so much, Richard. Um, Adam, let me, let me just interject here. Uh, Dr. Kellis, are you, are you present? And Raul, can we elevate Dr. Kellis to presenters? And yes. can we uh, start his slides presentation? Uh, so again, I'm sorry for for uh, for, for confusing this morning. Um, we will shorten our 15 minute break later. Uh, I will try to accommodate accommodate uh, accommodate Dr. Kelly's. Um, uh, Dr. Kelly's, I will uh, um, <laughs> two minutes before the uh, your time. I will I will I will uh, I will tell you that. So please go ahead. Uh, Mac, I don't see anyone with that name. I may be wrong. Uh, Jean, can you take a look into it? No, I yep. see. I see. He's here. Doctor Manoli Skellis. Oh. <clears throat> yeah. By the way, you can start. Uh, yeah, you can start. Everyone can start their videos, so it should be good to go. Okay. okay. Great. Thank you so much. Okay. Wonderful. So thank you so much for the opportunity and thank you for the organizers for putting together this wonderful meeting. And I really apologize for the confusion. Um, my email somehow did not come through. So what I would like to tell you about today is our single cell dissection of pathogen associated changes in Alzheimer's disease. So as you know, both HSP1 that we've heard a lot about as well as CMV infections have been associated with Alzheimer's disease. There's been a lot of biology surrounding HSP1 and also CMV has actually been shown to be increasingly associated with Alzheimer's disease by work of, of many, including David Bennett in the Ross Map cohort. So we have been collaborating with David Bennett very closely to link genetic variation across common and rare variants with single cell profiling of the postmortem brains from the Ross Map cohort at the epigenomic level, at the transcriptional level, in both healthy and in disease samples in this longitudinal cohort of aging that he has assembled at Rush University. We then integrate all the data to predict driver genes, regions, and cell types associated with diverse phenotypes, and of course, validate our predictions. And in this particular case, we exploited the Rossmann cohort and the CMV and HSV1 annotations to ask several questions that we can using single cell profile. In particular, what are the cell types implicated? What are the brain regions implicated? Are there roles for microglia and vasculature specifically? What are the cell-cell communications associated with pathogen response? What genes show the strongest changes and in what cell type are they acting? What are the differences and similarities between the different pathogens of CMV and HSV1? And do pathogens lead to a distinct Alzheimer's-associated transcription state that non-pathogen-associated uh, changes uh, uh, show? 
So uh, just to introduce very briefly the cohort, this is more than a thousand individuals that have been followed longitudinally and a large number of uh, clinical variables are associated, including diverse risk factors and pathogen exposures, as well as multiple types of methylation, next generation RNA sequencing, proteomic, neurobiology, structural MRI, quantitative clinical phenotypes, and of course, syndromic phenotypes. We ourselves have contributed a large number of single cell profiles and uh, also methylation profiling, uh, histone modification profiling, collaboration with Phil de Jaeger over the years. And we have been exploiting this cohort uh, to ask relationship for many different phenotypes, given its longitudinal nature. In particular, we basically focused on CMV and HSP1 and selected individuals that have both AD diagnosis and non-AD diagnosis. And you can see the numbers here. These are among the individuals that we have already obtained single cell profiling for. And there are additional individuals in the cohort that we will continue uh, profiling uh, as uh, funding allows. So in particular, our group has profiled more than 1,500 post-mortem human brain samples across this cohort and several other cohorts related to neurodegeneration as well as psychiatric Sym symptoms enabling us to start asking about questions of similarities and differences between these cohorts. We have categorized multiple subtypes of neurons, subtypes of uh, oligodendrocytes, microglia, astrocytes, as well as vascular cells. And we have profiled up to seven different regions of the brain and both single cell RNA, as well as single cell DNA accessibility that gives us some view of the regulatory regions of the different cell types. So, we have then used that to start asking about questions of what are the cells that show the highest vulnerability in Alzheimer's disease. In a paper that we published two years ago in collaboration with Li Pei Tsai, we've looked at non-AD, early AD, and severe AD individuals, along with their clinical and pathological variable changes. And we found that all of the major cell types show dramatic differences between AD and non-AD uh, between uh, different pathologies and cognition, and in particular that female individuals showed many more of these AD-associated subtypes of excitatory neurons, inhibitory neurons, and so on and so forth. We found that there are many changes that are distinct between cell types early in the disease progression, but late in the disease progression, we see a lot of common changes associated with um, the response to the damage, and we also found dramatic sex-specific differences with 3,000 genes, for example, differentially expressed between men and women prior to AD, and 6,000, even more, during AD, suggesting that we should be really thinking about sex-specific and cell type-specific therapeutics. In particular, we found that myelin pathways were activated in men, but not in women, uh, postulating that perhaps white matter loss would be higher in women, something that we confirmed uh, pathologically using the MRI scan. We then looked for differences between regions of the brain, enabling us to now start asking where are these pathologies occurring and how are they affecting differently different types of neurons and glial cells. We found 30 subtypes of excitatory neurons, 23 subtypes of inhibitory neurons, a lot of glial cell variation across the different brain regions, and most importantly, we're able to paint a time course of AD progression using the single cell transcription profiles of all of the cells to start asking when are the different genes associated with Alzheimer's acting during that progression. So we can now start asking temporally, how are these changes occurring? We also looked at anatomically associated differences in transcription profiles, enabling us to paint different subregions of the hippon coupled structure here, as well as the internal cortex layers and have developed a lot of methods for augmenting single cell data with spatial information and for deconvolving mini bulk spatial data into single cell spatial data. We've also profiled a lot of non-coding activity using single cell ataxy, looking at how genetic variants associated with AD and various AD related phenotypes are localizing into microglia specifically, suggesting an immune component, again, consistent with the pathogen association infectious disease uh, etiology as well as the differences between the localization of genetic variants associated instead with psychiatric disorders. So it is in this context that we started asking about HSV-1 and CMV uh, annotated individuals to, to start asking, are there global differences in the layout of 
astrocytes, inhibitory neurons, oligodendrocytes, vascular cells, excitatory neurons, microglia that don't be seen, associated with AD and CMV, or either of the two, or neither of the two, and the same thing for HSP1. So we started asking what are the cell fraction differences, for example, that are occurring in our single cell data. And we found an increase uh, in uh, several uh, subtypes uh, of cells. In particular, if you look at control individuals here in green versus CMV and AD individuals in red, you see an increase in oligodendrocytes, and you see also a decrease in excitatory neurons. And for HSP1, you also see a change in the OPCs. We then ask what are the differentially expressed genes between CMV plus and CMV minus individuals in each of the cell types. Again, we found very interesting uh, enrichments for both astrocytes and microglia within these cells. These are implicating in the increased genes for microglia, a lot of immune related processes or inflammatory response, negative regulation for the CMV containing individuals, again, consistent with etiology as well as uh, increase in axonogenesis and axon extension potentially related with neuronal uh, damage and regrowth. Uh, we also found a lot of uh, changes uh, associated with decreased expression. And in particular, the strongest enrichments we're finding are with astrocytes, down regulation of synaptic organization, neuron migration, and other processes. We then specifically focused on the combination of the two pathogens. We found that a large number of the HSP individuals also showed CMV, enabling us to now start carrying out a different set of responses that are asking of comparisons that are asking for CMV versus non-infected, and also HSP1 in the context of CMV versus non-infected, given the number of individuals here. And you can see here the number of cells is in fact dramatically decreased for CMV individuals. You see many fewer cells, even though we have 14 individuals, you see that there are twice as um, uh, fewer cells in CMV individuals uh, compared to controls, suggesting again, uh, perhaps you know, strong differences here. So we're now starting to carry out these comparisons here to start asking about CMV versus controls in the context of non-AD and in the context of AD and same for HSV1 in the context of AD and in the context of non-AD. This actually starts leading to a lot of very interesting insights. We're basically looking at upregulated pathways in oligodendrocytes associated with response to stress, upregulated in microglia associated with inflammatory response, endothelial cell migration in astrocytes, again, implicating the vasculature, uh, upregulation of blood vessels in astrocytes, downregulation of axon development and ion transport in excitatory neurons, again, in CMV. Uh, minus versus CMV plus individuals against chemical synaptic transmission, cytokine mediated signaling, regulation of neural projection. So there's a lot of changes that are starting to uh, paint a picture of what could be the pathology underlying this, and that can be helpful, hopefully, to this community in guiding additional experimental follow up here. So then comparing HSV plus versus minus in the context of CMV, we're asking how much does the HSV pathogen uh, lead to the additional expression changes. Again, cytokine stim stimulus increase in um, microglia, axonogenesis in astrocytes, regulation of cellular response to stress in oligodendrocytes, and positive regulation of binding, as well as synapse assembly, down regulation, chemical synaptic transmission, synaptic pruning, down regulation, and uh, response to ions. So uh, very interesting uh, changes here. We are then asking for CMV plus versus CMV minus. Now in the context of Alzheimer's disease, maybe are Alzheimer's individuals with CMV different in their transcriptional profile than Alzheimer's individuals without? And we're finding cytokine mediated signaling uh, changes, iron, iron and cytokine response uh, in microglia, as well as calcium in uh, astrocytes, myelination and fatty acid metabolic processes in oligodendrocytes, again, consistent with a lot of the biology here. Chemical synaptic transmission down regulation in sedentary neurons, neurotransmitter secretion, et cetera. Looking at astrocytes, down regulation of DNA templated transcription, axon guidance in uh, astrocytes, and then neuron migration across uh, all cell types. We are then asking for HSV1 individuals versus not in the context of AD. Again, most of those have 
CMV. So we looked at the comparison of HSV plus CMV versus uh, HSV, uh, no HSV and CMV. And again, we're finding protein stabilization in microglia, endothelial cell migration in microglia, protein localization to plasma membrane in oligodendrocytes, regulation of focal adhesion assembly across multiple cell types, and axon extension upregulation in astrocytes, synapse organization downregulation across multiple cell types, cell junction disassembly in microglia, response to cadmium, and myelination downregulation in oligodendrocytes. So when we now ask about common versus distinct changes in the context of non-AD and AD with HSP1 alone, sorry, CMV alone versus HSP1 with CMV, we're basically finding a lot of common changes, suggesting that perhaps the two pathogens are contributing to the quote-unquote dysregulation uh, in a parallel uh, way. And the next thing that we ask, actually asked is looking at these pairwise comparisons of how are the changes that are happening in the context of AD different between CMV versus non-CMV individuals versus AD versus non-HSP1 um, versus non-HSP1 individuals, again, implicating a large number of pathways that uh, we hope will be of interest to the community. So in the interest of time, I don't wanna uh, speak uh, a lot longer, uh, except to highlight uh, you know, a few of these uh, conclusions that are starting to come up, and then point to a collaboration that we have with Bill Eimer and with uh, Rudy Tanzi over at MGH to start validating some of those key transcription factors that we are uh, finding as prioritized from our computational analysis as potential drivers in each of the cell types, in microglia and astrocytes and excitatory neurons and dendrocytes that are both upregulated as well as downregulated. So these are transcription factors that are predicted to be upstream of many of these changes that are happening, and that could form, again, a helpful uh, resource for this community to start thinking about manipulating many of these uh, processes. So we're super excited to be collaborating with both Rudy Tanzi and Will Eimer, as well as, of course, David Bennett in the Rosbach cohort, Li Wei Tsai at the Picower Institute. And a lot of this work is led by Na Sun in my group, uh, who's carrying out computational analysis. All of the single cell profiling have been, has been done by Kiki Galani, Julio Montero, Li Lu Po, and uh, Xin Chin Wang. And uh, the computational analysis that I showed is shared across many members of the team. So that's where I will stop and uh, see if there are any questions. Well, I think that we are planning to save the questions for the moderated discussion. Uh, Mac, it, you can feel free to interrupt me and correct me. Uh, Adam, yes, I, you are right. Let me just uh, thank thank you, Dr. Kelly's. Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt, Adam. Uh, please. So there was a colleague from Dr. Itzaki group who was supposed to uh, briefly present uh, this morning. We will try to accommodate that person around the lunch break. So if, if that person is listening, I'm was that Dana Cairns? Because yes. Okay, because there was a note asking about this. Uh, yeah, so I'm sorry, there was uh, a trying to accommodate Dr. Kelly's. Uh, we, Thank you we so much. To, Thank you. We, we need to re reshuffle a little bit. I'm so sorry for the delay. Uh, take over, Adam, please. Okay, no problem. Thank you, Mac. And uh, I, I'm not going to say anything except introduce Dr. James Noble uh, from Columbia University. Dr. Noble, please. Can you guys uh, hear me and see my screen, yeah? Okay. Yes. Okay, great, thank you. So uh, thanks everybody and thanks to the organizing group for putting this together. And I really uh, want to acknowledge Dr. Tansy's wonderful job at framing the whole discussion for us, especially around the tough road it's been to get to this point. Uh, today, I'm gonna be talking about a line of work that I've been uh, uh, focused on over the last uh, 10 years or so and even longer, but uh, specifically around the, uh, the oral health, uh, insular, insular study of oral health that we've been performing in the Washington Heights uh, Inwood Columbia Aging Project, or YCAP, which has been led by my colleagues for years uh, before me. Uh, let's see. Okay, so just to acknowledge uh, the grant support here, I want to acknowledge uh, Dr. Makowitz uh, and, and their group for supporting a, a forthcoming R01 that's just getting off the ground now. I have no relevant conflicts of interest, but must uh, disclose I come from a family of dentists and that's how I got into this uh, line of work. So I'm gonna briefly review periodontal disease and um, associations that we've identified epidemiologically. And that's really my forte is in clinical and epidemiological work uh, focused on periodontal disease and cognitive aging and decline. 
and discuss the overall um, findings that we've had so far in the project and what we're up to next. Uh, we haven't really talked much about periodontal disease other than some of the microbes that have been identified. So I think it's worthwhile just discussing uh, briefly what the clinical picture is. And just to reiterate, it is a chronic biofilm infection. It's distinct from other um, uh, microbiomes that we've talked about, whether they be um, even others in the mouth or in the gut. This is really uh, something specifically at the gingival margin here. Um, so in normal periodontal conditions, we have a bone which supports a healthy gum tissue above it and really embraces the tooth uh, and its root. However, um, uh, with, with brief, basically inattention to dental care, um, there can be quickly an, an establishment of of a complex uh, dysbiosis that occurs really at the at the tooth and gum margin, uh, such that plaque uh, serves as the nidus for this uh, microbial colonization. It becomes uh, locally inflamed, can also associate with uh, both systemic inflammation, evidence of antibody response. Um, and eventually this, um, this soft tissue and even the bone beneath it begins to erode. A pocket forms, which uh, leads to even more uh, microbial establishment and dysbiosis, and eventually this inflammation uh, continues kind of on a cycle. Um, this erosion, uh, this phrase you may have heard called getting along in the tooth, uh, basically reflects this chronic system of, uh, of erosion, and the end-stage disease here is tooth loss. Um, the, uh, you know, clinically what we see in its early stages are, is evidence of gingivitis here, which is basically diffuse redness. Uh, you'll see uh, bleeding and uh, with either brushing or flossing, the good news is it's actually treatable and reversible, but it is something that many people experience with recurring episodes. And evidence of, again, this getting long in the tooth uh, demonstrates that there have been chronic changes that have come about. And eventually we can, we can even see um, uh, alveolar bone erosion below that as well. And as I mentioned, uh, tooth loss. So the epidemiology is also uh, quite interesting. It's also a lifelong disease. It's the second most common cause of tooth loss with the first being cavities. It is also an infectious disease uh, with, with cavities having a different microbiome associated with them relative to periodontal disease. Uh, cavities obviously are quite acute. They're painful. People tend to uh, focus on these and seek care for dentist, uh, dental care, but uh, periodontal disease is something that people just kind of contend with for a long period of time at home generally. Um, it's also highly prevalent. So depending on the study you look at and depending on the age that we look at, um, it's anywhere from 20 to 75% across U.S. adults. And again, it depends on the definition used both with uh, the assessments done as well as the severity indices that are available. It is also a health disparity, which I, I, I which is really where my background sits in uh, exploring for health disparities and modifiable risk factors in dementia. Um, uh, interestingly, it more affects uh, men than women, uh, blacks and Hispanics more than uh, non-Hispanic whites, but also aging populations and those with low education and smoking histories too. Um, as I mentioned before, it is a lifelong illness. There is evidence of salivary uh, dysbiosis beginning as age, young as age two. Um, and it's associated, as I mentioned yesterday, with the uh, frequent transient bacteremias, even with routine dental care, including brushing and flossing. Uh, there are various studies suggesting between 10 and 25% of people will have a transient bacteremia dem demonstrable after just simple toothbrushing. And those, those numbers are higher after um, tooth extractions or more focused care. Uh, and uh, I became interested in this, as I said before, uh, because of my just kind of uh, familial interest in this, but also at the time I became interested in this, there was uh, an established association between periodontal disease and coronary disease and stroke, and a, a rather controversial topic of premature uh, delivery and intrauterine um, uh, fetal re uh, growth retardation. But because of the associations with stroke and strokes association with dementia, I became interested in this further. I wanna also uh, comment on kind of the prevailing ideas about what is the microbiome established in periodontal disease. And this, this has been dogma for many years and that there are these different complexes of organisms um, that were cultivable and suggested that in order to get to this most uh, virulent strain, uh, virulent complex of, of organisms, one had to basically set up this milieu where these less, uh, uh, less pathogenic organisms were established first. Um, this is why there's been so much focus on this um, on the, these groups here, including P. gingivalis in particular, uh, but part of it is because it was cultivable earlier uh, as uh, assays could identify these both in, in culture as well as in uh, antibody assays. But this is really the, per, the proverbial tip of the iceberg here. And we now know that there's somewhere in the neighborhood of 700 different organisms that are identifable through 16S sequencing. Um, the, we also recognize that it's not just one uh, organism, although there are different hypotheses about what matters more. Uh, whether it's a keystone hypothesis of, of a single or multiple uh, organisms, or if these are just markers of other organisms that are, that are uh, in this milieu of really more of an obvious dysbiosis over time. 
So what are the, what's the data behind periodontal disease as a risk factor for cognitive impairment? I always find it's useful to start with um, its epidemiology. Um, when I first uh, started getting into this line of work, there were some uh, earlier studies suggesting associations between tooth counts and, and incident cognitive impairment, but not much had really been looked at around uh, uh, periodontal disease. And part of this is because there were actually not many studies that had available um, periodontal assessments and incident uh, cognitive assessments. But in the NHANES 3 data set, which I talked about yesterday, um, there was uh, one of the earlier data sets that had available uh, at the time uh, AA and P. gingivalis titers. And we identified specifically uh, in that analysis that there was a threefold risk for memory impairment. Admittedly, it was cross sectional, but these were uh, uh, you know, well established both exposures and outcomes. And most of the individuals are not th thought to be cognitively impaired beyond uh, just the testing, so not demented individuals. Uh, but And subsequently, with a 28-year follow-up in this cohort, it was identified that periodontal uh, uh, organism titers to antibodies, as well as clinical disease markers, were associated with a 20 to 50% increased risk of AD mortality. And that was based on uh, national death index records, as well as clinical follow-up over time. And further, there have been a couple of recently published meta-analyses, which suggested tooth loss was associated with about a 50% increased risk of incident dementia, and periodontal disease was associated with about a 20% uh, risk of incident dementia. And these were adjusted for many of the typical factors we think about for uh, epidemiological studies. So back in 2013, um, and I think, you know, just sitting through both yesterday's session and even this morning's, uh, you know, we recognize then and even more so now that this is an oversimplification of, of what we think is happening. But basically, uh, we recognize the clear reverse causality that somebody who is cognitively impaired is going to have poor attention to oral health care, and that leads to a cycle of tooth loss and worsening periodontal disease. But the, the interesting question I've been, I've been, uh, you know, really, uh, I think many of us here are interested in here is, um, you know, are there factors that actually uh, have the opposite causal direction? That is, are there factors such as caries, periodontal disease, tooth loss that actually lead to cognitive impairment? And Dr. Tanzi did a really nice job yesterday about framing this pathway between uh, amyloidogenic, tauopathic, and inflammatory changes over life. And so this is the kind of framework we've been looking at, hoping that we can look at periodontal disease longitudinally over time. So, you know, as of, uh, as of now, what we have is emerging epidemiologic evidence of periodontitis being associated with cognitive decline in Alzheimer's disease. But again, most of these studies are cross-sectional association studies, and there's a relative paucity of longitudinal epidemiological data, which really limits our inference and uh, again, uh, leaves us kind of stuck with the possibility of reverse causality associating with many of these findings. So uh, over the last eight years now, we've been working on an ancillary study of oral health uh, in the Washington Heights and Columbia Aging Project. Many of you know of this study led by Richard Mayhew and others. Uh, it's, it's enrolled about 6,000 individuals, all of whom are 65 and up. They're Medicare recipients, and they're in this broad area here in Upper Manhattan in the Southwest Bronx. Um, it's, a, it's a convenient sample, but uh, multi-ethnic. Uh, neighborhood. So we have about a third Caribbean Hispanics, a third uh, non-Hispanic Blacks, and a third non-Hispanic White. So it provides an opportunity for us to really look at, um, you know, what are the influences, sociocultural and genetic factors across multiple race ethnicities as far as cognitive aging goes. So uh, in 20, from late 2013 to early 2016, we were supported by the National Institutes of Dental and Cranial Facial Research to uh, really start out with basically an initial assessment wave um, and we're now getting to the point of being able to look at some of the uh, outcomes of interest. Uh, there are different ways that one can do periodontal disease assessments. We did a really comprehensive examination with six sites assessed per tooth. We ended up enrolling 1,130 participants, including about 20% who were either MCI or dementia, and whole mouth examinations were done on most of these. Uh, we excluded, basically, this excludes people who are edentulous. We had periodontal antibodies that were banked, uh, but relatively contemporaneous to these assessments. And then we did 16S uh, sequencing on about uh, 800 of those who we had culture uh, derived from. I would say right now where we are is that, you know, we have evidence of periodontal disease being very common. It's a health disparity. Clearly, there's a complex host and immune response. We have various measures of periodontitis that have been associated with neuroimaging and clinical evidence of Alzheimer's disease. And uh, you know, just to kind of update my slide from yesterday relative to Dr. Tanzi's really compelling discussion, um, you know, could, could the amyloid response to chronic infection be identified through tooth loss and attachment level over time with this evidence of exposure across a lifetime, but really the neurodegeneration in, in late life with inflammation being evidence of active uh, periodontal disease. My last slide here is uh, just to demonstrate what we're talking about for this, uh, this upcoming study, which offers us opportunities for looking at multimodal biomarkers of Alzheimer's disease we have a genetic paper that's forthcoming looking at perio and AD genetics. 
and uh, clinical dental imaging is also something on our on our radar, as well as the opportunity for multi-generational assessments. Thank you to my team, and again, thanks to the organizing group here today. Thank you very much, Dr. Noble. Fascinating couple of talks already this morning, and we'll move on quickly to Dr. Stephen Domini from Cortexime Incorporated, who will give us more information about implications of what's going on in our mouth vis-a-vis -vis our brains. Dr. Domini, are you muted? Um, uh, I, can you hear me now? Yes. I, uh, I'm Steve Domini, a Chief Scientific Officer of uh, cortex -Syme. I'd like to thank the uh, National Institute on Aging for this opportunity to present today. I have the following disclosures. So you are sharing your screen, I think, uh, or IT is sharing their slide deck. You want to share your deck? Yeah. Do you have my uh, slide deck there that you can pull up? It's up yeah. currently. Yeah, it's up and ready. Yeah, you can say next. Yeah. All right. I am not. Uh, I'm not seeing it. We're currently showing your disclosure slide. Okay. I have the following disclosures. I'm the co-founder of Cortexime and an employee of the company. I own Cortexime stock and I'm a co-inventor on ginger pain inhibitor patents. Next slide, please. There was interest expressed that I present our 2019 science advances paper on peach gingival and Alzheimer's disease at this workshop. So I can't do an in-depth presentation of the paper in 15 minutes. I have attempted to use some of the figures from the paper to highlight important findings and concepts, while at the same time introducing supporting research and clinical trial data that have arisen since the publication of the paper in January, 2019. As the title of this slide suggests, the paper is focused on the discovery of ginger pains, the highly periolytic virulence factors of P. gingivalis and AD brain. Ginger pains are present for P. gingivalis survival and pathogenicity, playing critical roles in host colonization, inactivation of host defenses, iron and nutrient acquisition, and tissue destruction. P. gingivalis is best known for its role as a keystone pathogen in chronic periodontitis. Here I have summarized the important findings from the paper. Ginger pain levels in brain correlate with AD diagnosis and tau and ubiquitin pathology. Ginger pains are directly neurotoxic and fragment tau. Oral infection of wild type mice with PG results in PG brain invasion, induction of A beta 1 to 42 can be blocked with small molecule ginger pain inhibitors. Next slide, please. I highlight this paper from Keiko Watanabe's lab for the background section because it is very important. However, it did not make it into our science advances introduction section because it was published while our manuscript was in the final stage of review. In the paper, they show that oral P. gingivalis infection of wild type mice induces AD pathology after 22 weeks, and the PG and ginger pains were detected in the hippocampus by PCR and IHC, but not in sham infected controls. Ginger pain localized intranuclearly and perinuclearly in microglia, astrocytes, and neurons, and there was a significant increased expression of IL-6, TNF-alpha, and IL-1 beta. They know that neurodegeneration was evident in the PG infected group, and that there was increased gene expression of APP in base one. Extracellular A beta 1 to 42 was detected in brain parenchyma, and phospho tau was detected and NFTs were evident and infected, but not in the control group. Next slide, please. This next slide shows figure one and some panels from figure two from our 2019 science advance paper. Both arginine ginger pain B abbreviated as RGPB and lysine ginger pain abbreviated KGP antigens in brain independently demonstrated a significant correlation with AD diagnosis, tau load and ubiquitin load. Intraneuronal ginger pain was confirmed in neurons of AD hippocampus with bright field microscopy and IHC controls. And ginger pain was shown to co-localize with tau tangles and intranormal A beta using immunofluorescence. Next slide, please. This next slide highlights a follow-up study we recently published in the Journal of Alzheimer's Disease demonstrating that in vitro, P. gingivalis can infect neurons and persistently express active ginger pains intraneuronally. Immunofluorescence staining with specific ginger pain antibody demonstrated a large diffuse field of ginger pain antigens around intraneuronal PG, and the intraneuronal ginger pains were determined to be active using ginger pain activity probes. Next slide, please. This is a second follow-up study we presented earlier this year at the ADPD 2021 conference, highlighting the use of immunogold electron microscopy to determine the intracellular location of arginine ginger pain B in an AD middle temporal gyrus. We detected the arginine ginger pain B antigen within the cytoplasm of endothelial cells 
lining blood vessels near and within mitochondria, near and within cell nuclei and within synapses. It was also associated with intracellular fibular structures. Next slide, please. With, with this slide, we are back at the results section of the 2019 Science Advance paper with a section on the identification of lysine gingipane protein and P. gingivalis DNA and AD cerebral cortex and preclinical cerebral cortex. We show that immunoprecipitation of KG from, KGP from cerebral cortex with anti-KGB polyclonal antibody CAB-102, revealing that the, the 50 kilodalton catalytic subunit of KGP along with higher lower molecular weight KGP species. CAB-102 specificity was independently validated at the University of Auckland Brain Bank using IHC controls and AD and not AD brain tissue. And CAB-102 specificity was also validated at the Potempa lab using PG mutant strains lacking KGP expression compared to KGP expressing strains. The KGP IP results were supported by qPCR PG DNA from the same brain lysates as the protein samples analyzed. An important concept of this experiment is again, the demonstration of a continuum of ginger pain and AD pathology present in non demented control brains. Next slide, please. This is a recently uh, published RNA-seq study. The authors identified P. gingivalis RNA in human prefrontal cortex. In brain with detected P. gingivalis reads, they examined genes that were differentially expressed. To exclude any confounding effects of disease processes, they limited their analysis to prefrontal cortex and neurologically normal controls. 2,189 genes were found to be differentially expressed in brain tissue with P. gingivalis reads. Next slide, please. We again return to the results section of the 2019 Science Advance paper, where we show that tau is fragmented by ginger pains. Because we identified co-localization of ginger pain with tau tangles in AD brain, we investigated if tau was a target for ginger pain proteolysis. In undifferentiated SHSY5Y cells express high molecular weight forms of tau, infection with PG showed a dose-dependent loss of soluble tau within one hour as measured by the tau-5 antibody. PG ginger pain defective mutants showed soluble tau levels similar to Uninfected cells indicating that ginger pains were responsible for the loss of the tau-5 epitope. We then identified ginger pain cleavage sites within recombinant tau using purified ginger pains and mass spec. Next slide, please. This is a follow-up tau in vivo study we presented this past summer at the AIC 2021 conference showing that in brain lysates from CVN mice orally infected with PG for five weeks, the levels of phospho tau-217 were significantly greater than mock infected controls. And the ratio of phospho tau 217 to tau was significantly increased with PG infection versus control. Next slide, please. We return again to the results section of the 2019 Science Advances paper where we reported on the development of small molecule brain penetrant ginger pain inhibitors after determining that the neurotoxic effects of the ginger pains were due to their proteolytic activity. We then conducted an in vivo ex experiment demonstrating that stereotactic injection of ginger pains into mouse hippocampus causes neurodegeneration that can be blocked with peripheral administration of brain penetrant ginger pain inhibitors. Next slide, please. Now with brain penetrant ginger pain inhibitors in hand, along with ginger pain knockout strains of PG, we were able to conduct an in vivo study showing that mouse brain A beta 1 to 42 increased significantly after all infection with PG compared to mock infection in mice treated with KGP inhibitor core 119. Mice infected with RGPB or KGP knockout strains of PG had brain A beta 1 to 42 levels no different than mock infected controls. In addition, we showed that in vitro, soluble A beta 1 to 42 bound to the surface of PG and significantly, significantly increased PG death compared to A beta 1 to 40, A beta 1 to 42 scrambled and BBS vehicle control. Further, in vivo studies demonstrated that oral administration of a KGP inhibitor effectively treated PG brain infection and prevented loss of hippocampal GAD67 interneurons in vivo. Next slide, please. Next, through medicinal chemistry efforts, a lead KGP inhibitor was identified that was potent, brain penetrant, and orally bioavailable known as CORE388. In figure H, we show that KGP inhibition by CORE388 inhibits the growth of PG and defined growth medium in vitro. In figure I, we show that PG develops complete resistance to moxifloxacin with a minimum inhibitory concentration, increasing over 1,000 fold in 12 passages, whereas no resistance to CORE388 developed in two independent assays. In figures J, K, and L, we show that in an established PG brain infection in wild type mice, oral dosing with core 38 twice daily result in dose dependent efficacy and reducing PG load in the brain and decreasing levels of ABA1 to 42 and TNF alpha. Subsequently, investigational new drug enabling studies were completed for core 38. And this figure concluded the findings of our 2019 science advanced paper. Next slide, please. We next moved into preclinical studies with CORE388 and published a report in Pharmacology Research and Perspectives. 
on the verification of KGB target engagement by core 380 after oral administration in aged dogs. Porphyrmus gule found an oral cavity of dogs and associated with periodontal disease is the only other bacterial species known to produce ginger pains. A 28 day dose response study, core 38, was shown to inhibit the KGP target in gingival curricular fluid and subgingival plaque using an activity based probe. In a separate histology study, older dogs showed evidence of increased P. gule DNA in neuronal KGP in the hippocampus compared to young dogs, similar to recent observations of ginger pain in human AD brains. Next slide, please. After the core 388 IND application was approved by the FDA, we conducted phase 1 slash 1B safety and PK studies. In the small placebo-controlled phase 1B study in mild to moderate AD patients, we detected evidence of decreased fragmentation of APOE and CSF after 28 days of core 388 dosing. In vitro and mass spec studies revealed differential fragmentation of APOE isoforms by ginger pains and generation of low molecular weight fragments, with APOE4 more susceptible to ginger pain fragmentation than APOE3 and APOE3 being more susceptible than APOE2. CSF analysis revealed a significant reduction of low molecular weight APOE fragments compared to placebo that was strongly correlated with a reduction in the pathologic decline of soluble CSF A beta 1 to 42 levels. The CSF APOE fragmentation results are now being followed up in a large one-year phase 2 slash 3 clinical trial with two the genstat and mild to moderate AD. Next slide, please. Here is the design of the GAIN trial of core 388, now known as the 2 the genstat. Key eligibility criteria for the trial included mild to moderate cognitive impairment with many mental status exam scores between 12 to 24, ages 55 to 80 years. Stable symptomatic therapies were allowed. And note, there was no pre-specified enrollment criteria for amyloid or tau positivity, APOE status, P. gingivalis positivity, or the presence of periodontal disease. A total of 643 patients were enrolled and randomized to either placebo, low dose, or high dose of Tuzogenstat and treated for 48 weeks with a six-week safety follow-up. Endpoints include standard 80 cognitive endpoints and biomarkers, along with PG and ginger pain biomarkers. Out of the 643 patients enrolled in the GAIN trial, 233 were enrolled in the periodontal substudy and underwent assessment of pocket depth and clinical attachment level baseline, and again at six and 12 months. Next slide, please. The GAIN trial is a global multi site study in the US and EU with a total of 93 clinical trial sites, and 643 patients were enrolled, as previously noted. Next slide, please. The game baseline demographics uh, have been analyzed and are as follows. The mean age and informed consent was 69.1 years with 43% males and 57% females. 70% of subjects were from North America and 37 and 30% were from Europe. 50% of subjects had moderate cognitive impairment and 50% had mild cognitive impairment. And 64% were APOE4 carriers. Randomization was stratified by mild or moderate cognitive impairment and APOE4 status. Next slide, please. 100% of GAIN subjects have evidence of systemic P. gingivalis exposure with a detectable anti-PG IgG antibodies, and 78% of IgG antibody tires that correlate with periodontal disease symptoms. Next slide, please. Over 90% of GAIN subjects in the periodontal substudy have monitored severe periodontal disease at baseline. Next slide, please. Here are the CSF biomarkers of A-beta 42-40 ratio, total tau and P-tau. Approximately 84% of GAIN subjects have traditional CSF biomarkers of Alzheimer's disease. Next slide, please. The anti-PG antibody concentration of CSF is largely independent of the albumin index, indicating intrathecal production of the anti-PG antibodies. Over 470 baseline samples have been analyzed, and 99% are positive for anti-PG antibodies. Only 2% of GAIN subjects have evidence of loss of blood-brain barrier integrity as measured by an albumin index greater than 9. The presence of these anti-PG antibodies in CSF further supports a direct P. gingivalis infection in the central nervous system. Next slide, please. In summary, P. gingivalis appears to satisfy modern-day Koch postulates for disease causation in AD. That is emerging that ginger pains differentially fragment APOE proteins, with APOE4 being more susceptible to ginger pain fragmentation than APOE3 or APOE2, with evidence in a phase 1b trial that core 388 or 2 the genstat decreased low molecular weight APOE fragments in CSF. And the large phase two slash three gain trial was rigorously designed and implemented to be a key pivotal trial establishing efficacy of a tooth genostat model to moderate AD and testing the ginger pain hypothesis. Baseline data of subjects in the gain trial support that an appropriate population was enrolled for testing a tooth genostat for AD. The gain trial top line data for disease modification of Alzheimer's will be presented next month at the CTAD 2021 uh, conference in Boston on Thursday, November 11th at 11.35 a.m. Next slide, please.
I'd like to acknowledge the uh, Cortexime research, biomarker and clinical development teams, advisory and other academic collaborators, development partners, clinical trial site personnel, and study participants and caregivers. Next slide, please. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you very much, Dr. Domini. And now, Mac, um, we have a 15-minute break planned. Is that changing? Uh, no. <laughs> yes, actually, it does. We will take five minutes or six minutes break, and we will start on time at, at 11. And we will try to accommodate our colleague from UK uh, after uh, David Gates' talk. Um, OK? Terrific. All so right, we'll take, thank you. Um, break five minutes, six minutes break until uh, eleven o'clock Eastern, and we will start exactly at at um, eleven a.m. Thank you so much, all. But um, let's move on to hear from Dr. Elizabeth Bradshaw from Columbia University, please. Hi. I hope everyone can see my screen and hear me. Can. Good. Okay. So um, I just really want to thank the organizers for inviting me. This has been like a really fantastic workshop. I've learned so much already in a day and a half. And, um, you know, I'm excited to talk about our work. It's really nascent. And so um, we're at super early stages, but hopefully um, I can still contribute to the conversation somewhat. Um, I want to talk about microglia genetics and pathogens in Alzheimer's disease. So um, when the Genome Wide Association studies came out for Alzheimer's disease, for late onset Alzheimer's disease, it really was a dogma changing moment for the field, just because previous to that, I don't think um, the innate immune system was getting enough attention in terms of thinking about how the immune system is contributing to Alzheimer's disease. Everything was very neuron centric. And then even right from the beginning, it was clear that it seemed that the genetics was implicating the innate immune system. And of course, throughout the body, every tissue has its own um, specific innate immune system. And in the CNS, those cells happen to be microglia. And so we really did make the assumption that the genetics was implicating microglia. Um, and that has continued to grow as more and more genetic studies have occurred. And so what I'm showing here is just a list of genes that have been implicated in late onset Alzheimer's disease. Um, this is circa 2019. And then what I did was overlay on it was the coloring. And so we have RNA sequencing transcriptomics from uh, cortical microglia, human cortical microglia. And what you can see in blue are all the genes that are nicely expressed in human microglia. And then in pink, what we see are genes that are at least fourfold increased in microglia compared to transcriptomics of total brain tissue. So as uh, the genetics field grows, it keeps um, continuing to implicate the innate immune system. And, and we do think that, I don't wanna close the door on other um, peripheral cells or other tissue macrophages, but we do think the microglia are playing a critical role. Um, one of the sort of dirty little secrets in genetics, of course, is that it recognizes a lo loci, it does not recognize an actual gene. And so in the beginning, it was a little confusing because the named genes were not always necessarily going to be the causal genes, but a lot of work and a lot of changes over time now um, have really gotten to the point where as the genetic kits are coming out, the genes that are implicated are also being named with them. And um, my group and many other groups have put a lot of work into trying to figure out what these genetic variations mean in terms of molecular outcomes for the uh, proteins that are attached to them. And so when we start to look at some of the results, what we're seeing is that we think the genetic variation is actually leading to a dampened microglial response. And so this is a figure from a recent review. And essentially what we're seeing is that a number of inhibitory molecules are either increased in expression or increased in function in terms of Alzheimer's disease risk, and a number of activating molecules are actually decreased in expression or decreased in um, function with AD risk. And so we think actually what the genetics is suggesting is that there's a hypofunctional uh, response to activation in these key uh, CNS immune cells um, it, with people with the genetic risk for late onset Alzheimer's disease. 
So um, as I mentioned, microglia are the main immune cells of the CNS. And so that means they are the first line of defense for pathogens in the CNS. And they do express many of the pathogen recognition receptors that are necessary to respond to bacteria, viruses, and a host of other um, pathogens. And we think they're also very important for T cell reactivation in the CNS. So when T cells are recruited, um, they have to be reactivated in order to participate in clearing um, the pathogens. So our hypothesis is that there's an interaction between late onset Alzheimer's disease associated genetic variants and pathogens, and that this is really coming to a head in this key um, Alzheimer's disease associated cell type microglia. Um, so in order to kind of examine this in detail, we needed to come up with a model and we decided to really focus in with HSV-1 as our, our first um, pathogen, but I think, you know, there's lots of other pathogens and I'd love to hear everyone's um, thoughts on other uh, pathogens that would work in this model. We picked HSV-1 for a number of reasons. The first is that there is really a large amount of literature connecting HSV-1 to late onset Alzheimer's disease. We know that we can identify individuals who are HSV-1 exposed or unexposed based on the um, serum antibodies. And there's already been a number of um, connections between genetic hits and um, HSV-1's interaction with late onset Alzheimer's disease. So I think it was Hugo who mentioned yesterday about ApoE4 carriers. So ApoE4 is a microglia gene. Um, however, in the CNS, we do think it's predominantly produced by astrocytes. So it is an interesting one in that it is produced by microglia. It may also act on microglia. Um, a really um, interesting paper that came out of a group from Genetech who was focused on pillar A. So they really did a deep dive um, analysis of a particular uh, locus that's associated with Alzheimer's disease. They determined that pillar A was the key gene that's involved in that locus's association to late onset Alzheimer's disease, and that there's actually a point mutation between people with the risk allele and the protective allele. And the risk allele changes the um, silic acid binding domain in pillar A and allows for a higher binding to glycoprotein B from HSV-1 and it allows for more entry of HSV-1 into um, innate immune cells. And so that's another reason why we wanted to focus on HSV-1 because it keeps our model very simple because HSV-1 can directly enter into innate immune cells. We don't have to have a complicated co-culture system with multiple cell types um, for the microglia to respond to. So our goal is to um, be able to look at more genetic associations and see, and Hugo, I think also sort of alluded to um, some other genetic variants that may be involved in HSV-1 and late onset Alzheimer's disease, um, and then really get into more of like the mechanistic questions of this interaction between the genetics and the um, pathogen. So really understand how do microglia of different genotypes respond to pathogen associated molecular patterns or PAMs, particularly in this case, the ones that are associated with HSV-1. Um, do these AD associated genetic variants modulate microglia viral infections and do microglia genetic variants influence T cell responses to pathogens? I think T cells in AD could probably be its own um, workshop, but we think they're very important obviously um, in dealing with pathogens. So, in order to do this, we really need a robust uh, microglia model to study the genetic variation. Um, mouse microglia are great for studying microglia in vivo. They're really not ideal for studying human genetic variation. iPSC-derived uh, microglia cell lines are an excellent model. Um, they're really uh, critical when you have rare variants and they're not widely distributed in the population. But in order to use them, you really need to know the causal um, genetic variation so that you can use CRISPR-Cas9 to, um, to create both the disease state and the corrected version. Um, so we've taken a different approach and our approach is to use, is to look at microglia from large numbers of people and look at their natural genetic variation. And so obviously collecting um, microglia from hundreds of people is a difficult task. So we've turned to an in vitro human microglia-like model where we start with a much easier to sample uh, tissue blood. And so 
From the blood, we're able to isolate monocytes. And then we have a very simple uh, protocol where we culture monocytes in serum-free media with recombinant cytokines for 10 to 14 days, and that leads us to a microglia-like cell. And so another advantage to using blood is it really lets us um, play with the uh, probably the biggest risk factor for late onset Alzheimer's disease age. So if we really want to focus in just on the genetic associations, we can stay with young to middle-aged healthy adults and, and not have the confound of disease, or because we can still uh, readily access blood from older individuals, we can look in individuals who are um, aged uh, with or without disease. And so that allows us to incorporate um, the aging immune system, which is going to be a critical um, component of all of these pathogen responses. So to validate our um, microglia model, our MDMI, um, what we did was we really looked at gene expression changes between um, the monocytes that they came from and then uh, their final polarized state. So microglia really have been um, uh, characterized using RNA sequencing. So that's where we're most confident in how to define them. And we found that our model upregulates um, many, but not all of the microglia specific genes that have been associated with them. Um, we also did some in vitro experiments looking to see if our, our model um, recapitulated some of the functions of ex vivo human microglia that have been cultured. And we found they were more similar to the human microglia than to the human macro macrophages. Another really interesting um, phenotype of our model is that they're actually quite stable in culture for many weeks. And this is a phenotype that is definitely not shared with the monocytes that they're derived from, nor is it um, shared with actually cultured macrophages. So it's much more reminiscent of true microglia. Um, so with our model, what we've been really focused on is really taking um, monocytes, uh, genetic variation or SNPs um, that we know are associated with disease risk and looking to see how they influence differential RNA or protein expression um, in hopes that we can get to some molecular basis of how the genetic variation could be leading to disease risk. And here's just one example of some of the work we've done. So this is uh, an experiment where we took 96 healthy individuals and we looked at their MDMI um, and then we measured a number of genes using uh, fluidime. And so this is just uh, two different isoforms of CD33. So CD33 is a genetically associated protein that we're very interested in. We know that it has two main isoforms, big M and little m. Big M is the main form that mostly has been studied in the literature and it contains the silic acid binding domain where CD33 little m has it spliced out. And what you can see is that when we start to group people based on their genetic background, we see an increase of the big isoform in individuals with the risk allele and a decrease of the little isoform, um, um, suggesting that you know, this is a uh, reasonable technique to use to look at genetic variation. And these cells are viable and healthy in, in cells. So we can now use this differential gene protein expression to try to fill in this dotted line to complete the triangle to really get to an understanding of how these genetic variations are leading to disease risk. And here is a really a key point for interactions with the environment. Um, in particular, we think pathogens are gonna be really important here. Um, so our microglia-like cells express pathogen response receptors as well as other signaling molecules. So this is just a random selection of some of the genes that um, we think are important for responding to pathogens. And we had RNA sequencing data from monocytes, macrophages, as well as our MDMI model. And you can see that most of these um, molecules, at least at the RNA level, are expressed in all three. But there are some variations in the level of some of them uh, between the different cell types. And we think this is going to be um, seen in, in the responses of these different cell types to different pathogens, uh, suggesting that it's really important that we look in the right type of um, innate immune cell. So maybe you know using monocytes as an example for microglia is maybe not going to give us the best uh, distribution of 
of the response that we're expecting to see in, in real microglia. So here's just an example of an experiment, very preliminary, that we've set up where we have our MDMI model and then we have monocyte-derived macrophages from the same individuals, and they've been treated with LPS from P. gingivalis. And so we looked at differential expression of your sort of generic uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines, and you can see that it looks like the macrophages are going to have a much stronger um, induction of IL-1 beta and IL-6 compared to our, our monocyte uh, derived microglia-like model, and um, within that, hopefully, we're going to see uh, variation based on individuals' uh, genetic background. Obviously, this is only three people, so it's too early um, to make any uh, conclusions about that. So um, I'd like to thank the team at Columbia. So this is work that is going to be undertaken with Wasim Aliman and Badri Badrajan. Um, we were very inspired by Dev Devand and all his work on HSV1 um, and clinical trials, as well as the team that's going to be working on it. Um, I didn't have a chance to talk about some of our work looking at microglia is antigen presenting cells and T cells in Alzheimer's disease, but that's collaborations with Larry Stern at UMass, as well as Jenny Jane at UPenn. And um, we're really interested in how um, pathogens are presented by microglia to T cells in the CNS. So hopefully um, we'll be able to get some data on that front. And so that is all, thank you. And um, we're now going to transition to a presentation by uh, Dr. Dana Cairns, who is collaborating with uh, Dr. Um, Ruth Itzaki at the University of Oxford. Uh, Dana, are you ready to present? Um, yes, so I'll just share my screen. Can everybody see? Oh. On its way. Sorry. <laughs> Let's see. It says you've started screen sharing, but it's not here yet. Oh, oh, oh it's here. Perfect, perfect. Um, yes, I'll, I'll be presenting a very brief uh, presentation on, on some ongoing work I have with Ruth. Um, and thank you to the organizers for the, the opportunity to very briefly discuss this unpublished work, um, as well as to Ruth, who's been just a tremendous mentor, and I'm very grateful for, for her um, tutelage and, and mentorship. Um, so what we're going to just kind of go over today is the, um, I should preface by saying last year we published a paper uh, proposing a causal role for HSV1 in inducing an Alzheimer's disease like phenotype in human induced neural stem cells. Um, and this was in the absence of any other exogenous mediators. And so based on this work, we've, we've done some follow-up studies to understand the potential role of any other infectious agents in reactivating quiescent herpes simplex virus um, as proposed by, by Ruth and Curtis Dobson back in 2002. So we have some really um, new and unpublished results here. I'll just very briefly go through go through them. Um, so first we had to understand if varicella zoster could infect our HANSC uh, cells that we use in our lab pretty routinely. And we found that actually they were able to um, infect HINSCs. You can see here, uh, the second row is just showing uh, VZV immunostaining. Um, and we're able to show that by qPCR expression as well. We also did co-infections just as, again, proof of principle to see if there were any uh, obvious phenotypes. And similar to what we had shown with HSV uh, in our publication, we saw that HSV on its own was able to induce pretty robust beta amyloid fibril formation, as we like to call them plaque-like formations. Um, and what was intriguing to us uh, was while the, the effects here were not so profound, the effects of the combinatorial infection was, was quite profound as evidenced by the increase in, in size or area of the plaque-like formations. And again, I'm trying to be very fast because I know People are hungry. <laughs> um, and another aspect to this whole story was that uh, HSV1 actually induced in our system uh, gliosis and neuroinflammation. So here we're showing immunostaining of GFAP, which is a marker of both glia and reactive glia as well. So similar to what we had shown previously, we see that there's a robust HSV, up, uh, sorry, robust upregulation of GFAP in response to HSV. And what was intriguing to us was that we also saw a similar upregulation uh, of GFAP in response to VZV alone, which is evidenced by qPCR as well. Um, and we also analyzed a variety of neuroinflammatory markers, interferon gamma here is shown, and you can see that VZV on its own also induced uh, this type of inflammation, which was really um, exciting for, 
for our study. And this is uh, the final slide again in the interest of time and being very speedy. Uh, the, the overall goal was to understand whether or not VZV could reactivate latent or quiescent uh, HSV infection. So here the, the basic treatment um, protocol was to infect with HSV for 24 hours, treat with valcyclovir to stop the infection, and then treat with either mock or VZV infection. And here you can see um, in this, this is the reactivation model, you see an upregulation of HSV, um, and also just indication that we have VZV infection. So this was really exciting from our perspective. Um, and this is also just showing verification of VZV infection by qPCR. And then again, over here, you see beta amyloid expression in the reactivated uh, latent HSV system, uh, which again was all very exciting for us. And we hope to publish these results very soon. And I think that's all I have today. So thank you very much. Well, that was indeed speedy. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Appreciate your efficiency. Your efficiency. So um, now we are moving to a moderated discussion. Should we uh, plan for thirty minutes, uh, Mac? Um, yes, we should plan for thirty minutes a moderated discussion, uh, and we will shorten by five minutes or uh, our, our or ten minutes our lunch break. Um, so obviously this is uh, our colleagues are moderating uh, chat room and have a questions. Uh, all presenters have access, they can unmute themselves. So please go ahead. Terrific. Uh, I believe that uh, some of the, Rachel, were you and your colleagues going to um, ask some of those questions? Yeah, we have some specific questions for um, some of the speakers, so I can kind of start. I guess um, one of the old questions for Dr. Noble was, have you looked at the microbiome of the oral cavity as part of the, the study? Yeah, I can answer that. Yeah, so the, in the original wave, um, we sampled the most posterior uh, quadrant in each, each of the four quadrants in all participants. And we did uh, 16S sequencing um, on a pooled sample. We have a, a metagenomic analysis ongoing for those older samples. And then for the forthcoming, basically a reassessment wave of about 900 of those individuals will be doing the same. Yeah. So we, we, uh, we, we worked with the Forsyth Institute on the initial wave. They did all of our analyses uh, using a library uh, kind of tailored to periodontal organisms. And uh, since then, we've had a microbiome center um, develop here, and we're working closely with them on the next wave. Thank you very much. Rachel, do you want to uh, present the next one in line? Yeah, I'm trying to triage now. Uh, <laughs> could it's the, a challenge. Uh, there are lots for, of good questions. For Dr. Domini, could the uh, mechanism have been uh, basically an interferon storm? Um, we don't think so, no. Can you say a bit more, Dr. Domini? Well, the the um, we have you know we have not looked at that, so I can't I can't uh, comment on that. Okay, thank you. I, I would say generally there's um, there's fairly good evidence that uh, similar to other kind of uh, chronic modifiable risk factors for AD, there is often a pro-inflammatory signal that we see peripherally. Um, that's been demonstrated in periodontal disease clinically for, for a long while, um, mostly around, uh, you know, kind of conventional assays around IL-1, IL-6, uh, TNF-alpha, uh, as well as CRP. So it's, it's a, um, not everybody has this. And I think this is kind of an interesting part of this whole story of you can have evidence of infection in the mouth. Um, and the big question is, does it matter if you have an immune, an autoimmune response or immune response rather? So there are plenty of people who have, um, you know, elevated antibodies to various organisms. I mean, just thinking about P. gingivalis in particular, what does it mean to have a positive antibody? Is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? Could it be good for some and bad for others? You know, is a vigorous host response uh, preferable or not? I think all these really compelling questions have come up uh, recently uh, in the last two days. Uh, 
Okay. Uh, I believe Dr. Tanzi had a um, question. Thanks, just a quick question. Um, this is Dr. Domini. I, how, I just want, how does a fragmentation of APOE promote AD pathology regarding plaques, tangles, and or neuroinflammation? I don't quite um, know if I understand the mechanism. Well, the, uh, we, have, we have a preprint up on the cell press uh, review that uh, we discussed a little bit in the discussion section, but uh, the mechanism, of course, we don't know for sure, but uh, it looks like it's consistent with a paper pu published by Mucard uh, 2019 in uh, scientific reports where they showed uh, uh, A-beta-42 uh, bound to fragments in, uh, in uh, AD uh, brain tissue. And they actually suggested that uh, if you decrease the fragmentation of APOE, that that will actually um, uh, increase the uh, uh, clearance of A beta 1 to 42. So um, our hypothesis is that the ginger pain fragmentation of the uh, APOE is actually affecting the uh, uh, solubility and clearance of uh, A beta 42, and that blocking that fragmentation actually increases the amount of. Uh, a beta 42 that uh, can be uh, uh, solubilized and cleared to the CSF. And that's why we actually see a reduction in the uh, decline of the uh, CSF A beta 42. If I may, um, Dr. Lodo and Melissa, I was uh, going back and forth in the chat with a couple of people, including Dr. Schneier and um, Dr. Crowther, just about these opposite effects that we're seeing in mice versus humans with respect to effects of toxo. Can you, you know, uh, uh, Dr. Crowther uh, mentioned maybe it has to do with the time frame in which we're observing uh, effects of toxo. I think you've cut out, Adam, but I think I heard your, <laughs> your okay. most Yeah, this is, is such an interesting point, right? So um, certainly in humans, um, the reports that have looked at toxoplasma as a predictor of, of cognitive deficit, deficits have suggested that it's a negative, uh, you know, um, it has a negative effect on, on cognition, but um, certainly in our animal model, that's, that's not really what's seen. And, and so it is possible that it's a timing issue. I also wonder to some degree whether you know, we know that mice are a great model for studying immunity to toxoplasma, particularly with respect to adaptive immune responses, but there are some really key differences in, in some of the innate immune responses to toxoplasma infection in mice and humans. So in mice, I didn't go into the details on this, but we know that um, toll-like receptors are um, key for inducing the production of um, uh, Toll-like receptor expression on dendritic cells and recognition of a toxoplasma protein is key for inducing IL-12 responses, which are protective. But human toll-like receptors um, have not really been implicated in innate immune control to the same degree. So TLR11 and 12, which recognize toxoplasma in the mouse, um, are not uh, functional receptors in humans in a way that's protective. And so to some degree, I wonder if some of this is a species difference with respect to innate recognition of the parasite and that that might be driving some of this phenotype, but that's, it, it's really speculation. Um, so in some respects, I think that we're really using the parasite um, in the mouse model as a tool to try and understand the, the biology of microglial associations with the amyloid. Yeah. Very interesting. Definitely something we'll have to follow as the literature develops. Thank you. Uh, there are some comments going to uh, from Dr. Tanzi to Dr. Domini in the uh, uh, in the chat as well. Um, uh, with uh, Rudy's asking in AD clinical trials, we want to increase CSF A beta forty two, which would indicate uh, amyloid clearance from the brain, um, not decrease it. Uh, did you mean to say increase? Well, I said uh, we, de we decreased the pathological decline of A-beta 1 to 42. So that's, that's my statement. So we are actually increasing uh, CSF A-beta 1 to 42 and the CSF towards normal. Yeah, that's, that's what we're saying. Thank you. There was a follow-up follow question regarding the interference storm. Um, it might POCD join the list of bugs if a cell or a cytokine were the final common signal?
I think that was a question for Dr. Domini. I'm sorry, please repeat the question. I didn't realize that was. A, that was oh, sorry. Um, there was a, uh, might POCD join this list of bugs if a cell or a cytokine were the final common signal? I, I, my uh, connection is not really good. Please repeat the sentence one more time. I missed the first couple words. Might POCD join this list of bugs if a cell or a cytokine were the final common signal? POCD. Yeah, that's what the, the person typed. I, I don't understand what that is. Postoperative <laughs> cognitive dysfunction. So delirium after, after surgery, right? Is that what they're referring to? Postoperative post cognitive dysfunction. Yes, postoperative cognitive decline. Well, what our hypothesis is that the uh, ginger pains are getting into the brain and, it, and if that uh, uh, is, is happening uh, post-op, uh, you know, we could speculate that that might be involved. But uh, again, I, that'd be too far out there for me to speculate on. Thank you. Dr. Noble has his hand raised. Yeah, Stephen, I have a question for you too. Um, well, two really. Are, are you, do you think in your model that, as you just said, that this is ginger pain entrance into the brain or an organism itself that has, you know, some indicators of, of a presence like P. gingivalis, that's one. And then um, I also want, wondered if you could comment on the specificity of P. gingivalis um, for having ginger pains or are there other either periodontal or non-periodontal organisms that relate to your model? And it could be, because I think kind of uh, from where many of us sit is that um, you know, it's, uh, I think it's, it, it's a compelling model, but to place everything on one organism, um, you know, would suggest that maybe that's, it's a, it's a conventional, you know, it's a good model to look at, but maybe there are other organisms that behave similarly causing this cascade. And I was wondering if you could comment on that. Well, first of all, our, you know, with, to test our hypothesis, we needed to develop this really highly specific uh, molecule that, that actually is very potent and specific for ginger pains, right? And, and the trial is over now. We're going to present our results at CTAD and, uh, and uh, we'll know uh, in about four weeks if you can hit one bug, actually one virulence factor, and actually you know, modify the, the disease. Um, my original hypothesis uh, and the one that uh, Pfizer liked initially was that uh, you know the ginger pains were getting into the brain from the periphery. I didn't think that there was PG was actually getting into the brain, but we actually did uh, detect uh, uh, PG DNA in the brain. It's at very low levels. What we think is that there's a very small amount maybe of PG that actually gets into a neuron, maybe one uh, PG you know for millions of neurons, but it, they, they become factories. They, they secrete ginger pains. They can sit there and pump out ginger pains. That's been our um, uh, findings, uh, especially in vitro. And, and it looks like uh, the ginger pains actually do spread in the brain. That, I was working with a, a neuropathologist at, at UCSF, and he had thought the ginger pains were actually being transported uh, uh, along uh, neurons. Um, but the uh, uh, the ginger pains can't get into the brain without PG getting into the brain. They can uh, uh, track with the, you know, PG, well, one bacterium produces thousands of outer membrane vesicles. They're just packed with ginger pains. Those outer membrane vesicles have no problem crossing uh, barriers like the blood brain barrier, for example. And they, they've been shown to infect cells. We've done in vitro experiments and they can infect neurons, just, just outer membrane vesicles. They contain DNA, RNA fragments, um, LPS, uh, et cetera. Um, so it's probably a combination of, of the two that uh, there is some PG bacterium actually getting into the brain, but there can also be a, a significant component um, uh, like an algae bloom almost where you actually have you know, an active PG infection in the oral cavity, but not even, may not even be in the oral cavity. We found a lot of uh, PG in the, in the liver, cardiovascular system, and even in the pancreas. So, so the uh, niche of infection might not even be the oral cavity. Um, the only other, and the second part of your question is um, the um, other microbes as far as ginger pains go. So I mentioned the uh, Porphyromonas gule. It's, uh, it, it's normally found in uh, companion animals like uh, dogs and cats, and it, it is involved with periodontal disease in those uh, animals. And, um, uh, but Porphyromonas gule is the only other known bacterial species that, uh, that, that produces ginger pains. 
And uh, like I said in the talk, we, we did do a study in aged dogs, and uh, this was a you know, target engagement study. We were only looking at the oral cavity, but uh, as I mentioned, we did do a, a, a brain analysis in, in older dogs that weren't treated, but uh, we wanted to look and see if similar to humans that uh, the uh, uh, ginger pains, especially our target, which is lysine ginger pain, was getting into the brain. Sure enough, we could see it in the uh, neurons in the CA1 uh, part of the hippocampus, and, and we could see P. Goulet DNA. Now, in the discussion section of the Science Advances paper, we actually mentioned a study done in Japan showing that uh, uh, Japanese dog owners, that, that uh, they studied the uh, Porphyrmos goulet in the dogs and in, in, the, in the genetic sequences in the owners, and they could see the transmission of Porphyrmos goulet from the dogs to the owners. So that'd be another source of ginger pains besides P. gingivalis is actually Porphyrmos goulet from uh, pet uh, animals. But yeah, so yeah, look, there's all kinds of other microbes. Uh, you know, I, I grew up during the HIV era at San Francisco General Hospital and HIV causes dementia. We know that uh, treponema pallidum causes dementia. So I think there's room for all kinds of bugs to uh, cause dementia, but we're specifically going after porphyrmos gingivalis because we've been able to develop a highly specific inhibitor of it and uh, to test this hypothesis. And I would, I would say that, you know, for these other uh, microbes, if, if if there's evidence of virulence factors in particular that, uh, that can be targeted, I, I would recommend that. Thanks, Stephen. Rachel, any other questions in line? Or uh, I see Maya Corono. Corono? Sorry. Hi, I have a Hi. Hi. I have a question for Stephen again. Um, do you have any evidence for, uh, you know, finding this uh, microbe or any similar, uh, you know, pathology in the retina or the eye, any ocular tissue? Well, that's a great question. Uh, we uh, uh, have thought about uh, looking at the eye. We've actually had people ask us about, uh, about it, especially related to age-related macular degeneration. We, we haven't published this uh, yet and, uh, but you know, some of our immunohistochemistry in the brains, we can see uh, 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 a lot of ginger pains uh, or antigens in the lateral geniculate nucleus, which is, is as you know, one of the first uh, synapses running back from the uh, retina that, that then goes on to the occipital cortex. And, and uh, so there, it looks like there's ginger pains in that system, in the, in the, in the, uh, in the visual system. Um, but uh, we have, <laughs> We have other uh, indications actually stacked up in front of us, but we've actually been asked to, you know, take a look at, at, at what you're talking about. I mean, the, there's, there's actually been some groups showing that porphyrmose ginger valves can uh, infect some of the retinal cells, right? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, we have a question from Dr. Tanzi and then uh, Dr. Bradshaw. Yeah, yes, thank you. Um, I have a question for Dr. Loden. And, and uh, first of all, that was a really fascinating talk. I really enjoyed it. And I'm just wondering, what, there's this timeline for when you see amyloid clearance. And given what we, we saw with the protection of interleukin-12 interferon gamma increase in plasma, for, especially for patients who had amyloid in their brain, they had a better cognitive trajectory. Did you see a correlation between when amyloid started to get cleared uh, uh, with, with when you saw the most elevation on IL-12 interferon gamma, any, any correlation there? Yeah, so we've looked at um, IL-12 and interferon gamma early during acute infection, which is really when it spikes. It persists out during chronic infection, but we haven't yet looked um, at a correlation between the clearance of the amyloid and whether or not you're getting an increase in IL-12 and interferon gamma again at that later stage. It's just something we haven't had a chance to do yet. That's a really good suggestion. That'd be cool to look at. Yeah, let me know if you do that. That's great. Thank okay. you. Okay, <laughs> we'll do. So my question um, is for David Gate. So um, I just wanted to know if you could maybe expand a little bit about on narrowing down to EBV versus other potential viruses. I know, you know, if I remember correctly from the paper, you use publicly available databases to identify the TCR sequences connection to the um, to the viruses, and so. Um, do you feel that you were limited in your ability to identify all of the potential viruses that could have been seen 
through the TCR in the CSF due to what's publicly available? Or do you really feel that EBV um, was a winner on multiple fronts? Yeah, that's a good question. Of course, um, we're certainly limited based on what's publicly available. And even then it's biased towards infectious diseases because that's just where the most is known about TCR specificities. Um, I will correct you though, we, we did identify a TCR that was um, identified in public databases, but we also identified them in a non-biased way through um, using a, a glyph algorithm that was developed by Mark Davis at Stanford that um, we used a, a sort of peptide library approach where we incubated our TCR that kind of popped out from this glyph analysis and found that it was specific for one of these peptides from this, from this broad library. Um, so there were two ways we, we identified EBV specific TCRs. One was sort of this networking approach and the other was in this un unbiased way. Um, that's not to say that we don't see other virus specific TCRs in the CSF. There's certainly viruses for other, there's certainly receptors for other viruses like influenza, uh, other herpes viruses as well. We just found that these patients shared identical receptors for EBV and found that that was the most interesting finding to report. Um, there's really no other um, connections or at least associations with the diseased patients other than that EBV finding. Um, we're looking now at, at sort of a spectrum of age, age with healthy individuals CSF to hone in on more of these uh, virus specific TCRs and if they increase with age and if their transcriptome becomes more pro-inflammatory perhaps possibly um, predisposing people to neuroinflammation and, and, and neurodegeneration. But yeah, I think, you know, we're sort of leading the cart before the horse where we're generating tons of TCR sequences and not a lot of antigen specificities. So I think as these technologies pick up and we can go back to our uh, TCR lists, we can identify more antigens for those receptors and perhaps some of these antigens correspond to brain proteins or endogenous proteins. Thank you, David. And I'm going to get to uh, Dr. Reedhead's question in a moment, but before that, if I can jump in, uh, I received an email. Have you compared the expression of certain genes in paired samples of peripheral blood versus CSF? This is from Dr. Jay Pandey, who indicated that many years ago, his group showed that certain genes which were absent in the peripheral blood but were expressed in the CSF and some, uh, you know, were identified in some neurological diseases, including multiple sclerosis. And that question's for me, Adam. Yeah, yes. that's, a, that's a great question. I absolutely have done this. Um, so we've sequenced blood and CSF cells from the same patients and overlaid them. And indeed, um, we do see genes that are unique to the CSF. Um, I didn't present any of this data today, but it's coming online in science in, in a couple of weeks. Um, if this project was focused on Parkinson's disease, dementia, and dementia with three bodies, um, but we think that by using this technique um, that this person has suggested, uh, we've identified receptors that mediate the homing of cells from the blood to the brain. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to switch to Dr. Reedhead's question, uh, and then we have a question from Dr. Gandhi in the chat that we'll get to. Please. Thank, thanks a lot. Um, I had a question for Dr. Gate as well. Um, really enjoyed your talk. I loved, loved the methods and, the, and the, you know, the, the, the way you laid things out. I was wondering what your kind of functional interpretation is of the EBV uh, TCR sites that you, that you were reporting. Do you take that as a kind of a proxy of EBV exposure in the brain for some subset of patients? Or do you, you know, could, could this be a subset of patients that just have a, kind of an unusually strong or perhaps specific um, you know, EBV response, you know, so, so I guess in some sense, is this, is this a good thing or a bad thing for their efficiency against EBV? Or would you just take it as a straightforward proxy for exposure? Yeah, I think exposure is difficult to address. Um, as you know, the viruses are very difficult to detect in the, in the, in the brain tissue. Um, but I think that this ties to what I would call immunogenetics, where these individuals perhaps have different, um, expression of immune genes, specifically HLA genes, that are putting them at a, at a greater risk of having a more pronounced immune response or a different immune response to a viral infection. Um, I don't 
I don't believe that EBV causes Alzheimer's disease. At least I don't think that my data are, are causal evidence of, of EBV in Alzheimer's disease. Rather, I think what it suggests is that antiviral T cells could initiate neuroinflammation responses in the CSF, and this could be a contributing factor to Alzheimer's pathology. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. We have a question from Dr. Uh, Sam Gandhi in the, uh, in the chat. He's asking, in considering whether POCD, post-operative cognitive decline presumably, belongs with infectious causes, is the prevalence of bacteremia during anesthesia or surgery known? He's saying ortho, ortho sure, is the most POCD-associated surgery. Does anyone have the answer to that? Sam, it's a, it's a great question. I don't think there is an answer to that around orthopedic surgery. Um, I've looked before and I was just looking again. I mean, as I said yesterday, the rates of bacteremia um, around teeth brushing and flossing, as well as, um, you know, tooth extractions, that has been established. But for other general surgeries, it's not well known. And I'm sure you've seen in your practice, as I have as well, that, you know, people present to us after having undergone general anesthesia, all sorts of surgeries, periodontal interventions, and they just aren't as sharp cognitively. And the question is always, what was it about it? Was it an inflammatory state, a bacteremia, the anesthesia itself? Or, you know, of course, there's always the possibility of greater scrutiny uh, for somebody who's suddenly recognized as having a new problem. Um, it's a great question. Um, seems like it would be fairly straightforward to try to answer. My understanding of the kind of ortho and surgical literature is that it usually is something that's explored in the context of overt bacteremia. And what we're really focused on here is more transient or asymptomatic bacteremia. So well, this has lots of implications for uh, people who are interested in delirium and cognitive decline more broadly. Uh, fascinating area and one that we know far too little about. Mac, you have your hand raised. Yeah, I, 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 I have a question for Dana. Um, Dana, can you add to the conversation between Dr. Tanzi and Do Dr. Boskakov about um, titer in your experiments? Um, I didn't see the where the discussion was, but I can I can say that um, we use typically very low titer, a low MOI, uh, to be more reflective of of what's physiologically present in infected uh, individuals. So in in the studies looking at VZV and HSV, the MOI was comparable for the infections. So, okay, thank you. Thanks. Yeah, I would just, just add that in, in mice, you need higher titers. It's not, that virus is not adaptive for mice. And so I think it's, a, it's tough to compare to human. Well, I would like to add on my part that titer 10 to the eight is equivalent to number of cells in mouse brain. Mouse brain has 10 to the eight of cells. I'm talking about old, old cells, neurons, astrocytes, microglia, and the telial cells. When you're injecting 10 to the eight of PFUs, like forming units, you're ejecting 100 times more of viral particles, as each PFU has about 100 viral particles. So essentially, you injecting 100 particles per each cell of mouse brain. I'm not sure whether it's relevant, not relevant, but if you, <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> and how it's relevant to human brain, I don't, but I don't see any circumstances where human would get that amount of um, uh, uh, HS, HSV1. You know, it, it's, it's a model system. And the point is that the mice expressing A beta in high levels lived longer with that high titer of HSV. And in a properly controlled study to look for HSV association on plaque, we saw it. So, you know, we can maybe we can take it offline and try to compare notes and, you know, um, but, you know, it is what it is. And I think we all agree that until we do the physiological experiment, we need to take knock in mice with wild type APP, make a normal levels of A beta you would have in human brain, and then infect and see if it's still, you know, uh, protective. And until we do that, we can, you know, it's probably a moot point to just to compare models. And, you know, so, sorry, sorry. Great, thank you so much. Rachel, Elise, uh, Jean, and any other question? Otherwise we will break for lunch. I guess let's do one more question for Dr. Gates. Um, 
If, as you say, that the T cells against EBV are creating some inflammatory state in AD, could not suppressing EBV replication turn down the volume of inflammation? Yeah, I don't see why not. Um, you know, we can even look at, at the transcriptome of some of these EBV specific cells and identify specific uh, proteins to target. Um, such as cytokines like CCL5. And, and I, I don't see why not. I think, you know, the mode of, of introducing those neuroinflammatory compounds might be the, the question whether you can introduce this intrathecally or if that even makes sense to do. Um, um, but yeah, I don't, I don't see why it wouldn't, wouldn't work to, um, to limit the disease. There's some evidence out of Taiwan in a retrospective study of of individuals who are on anti-hepatic medications that they had reduced um, tendency to, to progress to neurodegeneration. So there's some at least retrospective clinical evidence that anti-hepatic medications could be beneficial. Terrific. I think that's about all the time that we have. Uh, thanks for a terrific morning session, everybody. Mac, what time should we reconvene for? Thank you so much. So we will reconvene 12.45 Eastern time. So roughly 25 minutes. Um, again, you may not wish to disconnect. Uh, just simply mute yourself. So enjoy your lunch or uh, midday breakfast. <laughs> and again, we will see each other in 20, 25 minutes. Thank you. Thanks everyone. All right, it's 12.45. Uh, it is time for our next session. Welcome back. Um, we'll continue our conversation. Is there evidence for causation? Um, Dr. Nath, please. Well, thank you very much. Um, so I'm delighted to have the opportunity to uh, chair the session. And um, so I was told that each of the speakers will do their own introduction. <laughs> so I think, so we'll see how that works. So uh, the first speaker is Dr. Maslia and he's going to talk about HIV and Alzheimer's disease. So uh, Eliezer, I'll hand over the uh, uh, podium to you now. Thank you, Avi, and uh, thank you everybody for uh, being here today. I'm actually gonna share my screen. All right, can you see that okay? Yeah. Yes, oh. we can see it. You can All just put right. it in presentation mode. Yep. All right, thank you very much. So what I'm gonna do today is just to give you more of an overview of the status in terms of the question, if there is a relationship between HIV in the brain aging and Alzheimer disease and some of the pros and cons. So as uh, you all know, uh, HIV infects uh, macrophages early in the stage of the disease, as well as a number of other immune cells and uh, they penetrate through the blood-brain barrier, disrupting uh, tight junctions and um, activating these HIV-infected macrophages could activate uh, microglia and also by themselves, they, they produce uh, cytokines and chemokines that also activate glial cells and uh, trigger neurodegeneration. We know also as Dr. Not have shown that that TAT and a number of other secreted HIV proteins could um, cause neurodegeneration uh, and a lot of these pathologies. And this is typical of uh, what you see here, which is what we call HIV encephalitis, which is a typical disorder that we used to see in the old days before heart, uh, which was characterized by the presence of microglial nodules. These HIV P24 positive microglial cells, multinucleated giant cells, brain atrophy, and uh, myelin loss. And um, so we can see that this is a classical subacute HIV encephalitis, neuroinflammatory pathology that we see in the pre heart era. Now, uh, following the successful development of uh, highly active uh, antiretroviral therapies, what we have seen is that. Uh, 
HIV in the brain is a lot less um, abundant or non-existent. And there is also selection of uh, resistant uh, forms of HIV, compartmentalization, and uh, this uh, chronic HIV disease where um, HIV could be uh, inactivated or in a latent state, although this is a very controversial topic, but nonetheless, what we do see in the brain, even though we don't see the abundant HIV, we do see a, a chronic neuroinflammatory process with uh, uh, some uh, inflammation and, and cellular pathology. And it, it is uh, important to notice that uh, this is associated also with a number of comorbidities in these individuals that include, of course, aging, drugs of abuse, other viruses and uh, antiretroviral therapy. So aging is really one of the most important comorbidities here. Uh, I mean, the number of individuals with uh, AIDS, HIV over the age of 50 have increased tremendously. And we know that there is an increased cognitive impairment in individuals with HIV over the age of 50 and that this cognitive impairment is more severe. So then this really begs the question as to what is the relationship between uh, aging and uh, HIV or neuro-HIV with other comorbidities and to what extent through common mechanisms like um, protein aggregation, neurodegeneration, inflammation, vascular disease or white matter disease, these might be related to Alzheimer's disease and other related dementias like Lewy body, frontotemporal dementia or vascular dementia. And of course, uh, I mean, there are many explanations here, maybe that these are coincidental pathologies due to aging or the result as I was suggesting of common mechanisms or maybe uh, HIV in the brain accelerates aging and therefore could increase the risk for ADADRD. They could be codependent, or it could be that um, uh, other factors uh, like uh, antiretroviral drugs uh, 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 or immunosuppression, et cetera, could lead to these um, uh, ADADRD pathology. So really uh, many potential mechanisms. Now, um, here also, uh, there is a very interesting relationship between HIV and uh, A-beta. I mean, we heard yesterday from Rudy and others about the antiviral effects of uh, A-beta on uh, viral replication. And um, although there hasn't been a lot of studies directly looking at the effects of A-beta on HIV, interestingly, there are some amyloids producing the seminal vesicles that are anti-HIV, uh, antiviral. And we know also that uh, antiretroviral agents, for example, uh, disrupt microglial phagocytosis of A-beta and uh, metabolism of um, APP. We also know that the TAD protein, and this is uh, work by the group of uh, Avinath, um, uh, interacts with uh, A-beta and could form these uh, fibrils that are highly toxic and uh, very unique. So these are uh, uh, fibrils combining TAT and uh, A-beta. Now, we also know that uh, in individuals over the age of 50 with HIV encephalitis or HIV, we see much greater neurodegenerative pathology with increased astrogliosis, microgliosis, and loss of uh, dendrites that correlates with uh, cognitive dysfunction. And there has been work from um, the, the lab of uh, Dr. Bolsky that have shown that uh, the, in uh, genetic studies, uh, transcriptional studies, that there is um, common pathways, common genes that are dysregulated in AD and uh, uh, um, HIV-associated uh, neuronal dysfunction, uh, particularly in the area of uh, synaptic transmission genes. So um, here, one hypothesis could be that HIV and aging in combination with other factors might lead to, for example, defects on uh, mechanisms like protein uh, quality control uh, including, for example, the proteasome, and there has been their work by Ben Gelman showing that uh, HIV proteins, including TAD, inhibit a proteasome. 
Uh, also alterations in proteolysis and metabolism of uh, A beta and APP and work from Limpulium has shown that that inhibits um, specifically neprilysin and therefore A beta degradation. And finally, we have shown that uh, different uh, HIV proteins uh, uh, disrupt the uh, uh, autophagy, and that again could lead to uh, uh, protein accumulation. Go through all the slides, yes. But for example, uh, metal fourteen, I can take I, pictures. Please, me. somebody Please. needs to mute. Yes. yes. All right. So as I was mentioning, uh, we have shown before that in aged individual over the age of. Uh, 50, uh, there is uh, alterations in uh, autophagy, uh, particularly we reduce uh, uh, levels of uh, Beckling 1, uh, LC3, and mTOR alterations with uh, lysosomal disruption. And there are various mechanisms that have been shown to be at play here. M bottom line at the initial phases of HIV infection, probably uh, be a TAT uh, inhibiting uh, Beckling 1 uh, could be alterations and um, increased autophagy. But in the later stages, uh, there could be the opposite effect that is reduced autophagy. And this could be mediated by NEF uh, uh, and also HIV TAT uh, proteins that actually blocked uh, later stages of uh, lysosome, uh, uh, phallosome uh, fusion. And uh, so, as I mentioned, this could lead to accumulation of proteins like what we see in Alzheimer's disease. And we've done some studies of A beta, tau, and other proteins in the brains of uh, a, a individuals with HIV over the age of 50. And we have so seen is, uh, this increased A beta immunoreactivity in the axons and in the neurons, and also these uh, diffuse plaques forming in, in uh, multiple brain regions. Um, by double labeling, we see colocalization uh, in neurons of this uh, A-beta immunoreactivity, as well as these diffuse plaques. And ultrastructurally, we can see some fibrils forming both uh, intraneuronally and uh, extraneuronally. And uh, by immunoblots in these uh, individuals older than the age of 50 uh, with HIV, we could see increased uh, uh, A-beta dimers. Now, uh, there has been some studies by Chris O'Kim, for example, that have shown that HIV individuals with the APOE4 have accelerated accumulation of A-beta with um, uh, a correlation with some behavioral changes. And also there has been an association shown between A beta TREM2 in uh, individuals with HIV, particularly of uh, a Hispanic um, background. And in regard to uh, experimental studies, for example, a injection of uh, a lenti over expressing TAT in uh, the APP Pristenelen uh, model of Alzheimer's disease have shown uh, colocalization of A-beta and TAT, uh, as well as um, uh, alterations of the processing of APP and increased accumulation of uh, um, A-beta. And uh, we have shown similar results uh, in collaboration with Avenat crossing TAT transgenic mice with APP mice, where we see colocalization in the plaques of TAT and uh, A-beta. Uh, in a very recent study that I just heard from uh, David Bolsky, they actually have crossed their ACO HIV mouse. That is a really much better mouse model of uh, neuro HIV with uh, um, APP um, uh, presenilin models as well as with the humanized models and uh, have shown significant alterations and synaptic transmission. And maybe we could hear a little bit more from David later on in the discussion uh, portion. And uh, now there has been some studies of uh, uh, biomarkers showing a, a reduction in uh, A beta in CSF and uh, increase in tau in CSF and HIV patients similar to what I was see in uh, Alzheimer's, but uh, uh, more recent studies in plasma A beta ha haven't shown differences in, in uh, older HIV individuals as we see in AD. And in terms of uh, um, 
PET imaging, there have been a, no, a few studies on PET imaging, some of them like the one from the group of BOANS that haven't shown any differences in A-beta in HIV individuals. There is this single case that was uh, uh, reported by the group of Turner Georgetown that actually showed uh, a beta accumulation in the brain. And we have done some studies at the time when I was at UCSD with Chris Kim with a, a special paid uh, ligand showing some uh, uh, a beta accumulation in HIV patients. And as I said, a postmortem, some few plaques in, in the brain. Now, in terms of tau, uh, there has been some studies that have shown accumulation of tau positive uh, tangles in uh, older HIV individuals. We have seen increased tau phosphorylation and uh, p-tau positive neurons, but not exactly forming the tangles that we see in Alzheimer's disease. And by biomarkers, there are really all kinds of uh, studies, some of them so showing changes in different phosphatau epitopes, others doesn't show any changes in the phosphor tau epitope. So really a variety of results. And more recently, there was this study doing uh, tau PET imaging, uh, uh, comparing various HIV patients with Alzheimer's, uh, compared to Alzheimer's and not showing the increase in tau by, by PET. So uh, th that's that. Uh, as I mentioned, another important factor here is um, aging, and um, we know that during aging, in addition of the proteinopathy that I have talked about, we also have other alterations like uh, DNA damage, uh, increase in transposable elements and cell senescence uh, that we see in Alzheimer's disease. And there has been uh, now some studies in uh, older individuals with HIV. We, we looked at the um, uh, epigenomic changes and found in the brains of uh, HIV patients includes uh, methylation and uh, uh, accelerated epigenetic changes in the brain. There has also been studies shown in HIV TAD mice that there is impaired neurogenesis. And it is known that, for example, the BPR of HIV interferes with the DNA repair after um, uh, formation double strand breaks, uh, 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 HIV BPR binds to the repair complex and forms supercoiled um, DNA fragments, uh, increasing DNA fragmentation. And also there has been uh, studies showing that um, uh, BPR uh, induces cell senescence, uh, probably by a mechanism involving uh, uh, DNA damage, DNA fragmentation, but also oxidative stress. So these are uh, hallmarks of uh, aging that, that we see in HIV brain. So um, in summary, there is evidence that in older individuals with HIV, and oh, that's my signal to stop talking, uh, there is evidence that um, there are uh, multiple of these pathologies associated with Alzheimer's disease like A-beta, phosphorylated tau. I didn't talk about vascular synuclein, but also uh, uh, DNA repair alteration cells in essence. But I, I think that um, we really are missing uh, better longitudinal studies with biomarkers for Alzheimer's disease where we can really understand uh, better the the relationship between uh, HIV and Alzheimer's. We, uh, a couple of years ago, we funded this uh, RFA to, and hopefully we'll be able to report in the future about the finding of this RFA, looking at this question of HIV and AD in the context of aging. And more recently, we have this other PAR on multidisciplinary studies on HIV AIDS and aging that also includes the studies of uh, cognitive decline and um, uh, uh, potentially Alzheimer disease. And as I said, we really need better, more uh, longitudinal studies. We are participating in charter as well and other longitudinal studies in collaboration with NIMH and NINDS. So uh, hopefully we'll see in the future more studies that uh, will more definitively answer the question about the association between HIV aging and Alzheimer disease. Thank you very much. And I'll stop sharing.
Thanks, Eliezer. That was a terrific uh, presentation, tour de force. Um, okay, so the next talk is by Maria Nigo. And um, so Maria, can you uh, briefly introduce yourself and then uh, the podium is yours. I uh, can't hear you. See your slides, but uh, you're muted still. Unmute. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you now. Okay, fantastic. So um, I'm Maria Nagel. I'm a professor of neurology and ophthalmology at the University of Colorado School of Medicine. I'm a neurovirologist. I see patients with neurological complications from alpha herpes virus infection. And I also have a, a lab actively looking at BZD pathogenesis. So um, let's, let me share my screen. All right. Um, Avindra, can you see my screen? Yes, we can see it. Thank you. Okay, fantastic. Okay. Um, so so I'd first like to thank the NIA and the organizers for giving me the opportunity to share our work and the participants for your input. Um, today, I'm going to go over the background for alpha herpes viruses as modifiable AD risk factors. And because there's been a lot of work on HSV1 and AD already, I'll focus my talk on how BZD infection contributes to AD pathology, then present our preliminary studies on virus and olfactory system interactions. Um, so BZD, so pardon me, um, varicella zoster virus and HSV1 are both double-stranded DNA alpha herpes viruses. On primary infection, they produce uh, rash, BZV produces varicella or chickenpox, HSV1 produces herpes labialis or cold sores, or they can be asymptomatic on primary infection. Subsequently, these viruses establish lifelong latency in neurons within the cranial nerve, dorsal root, and autonomic ganglia along the entire nerve axis, as well as in enteric neurons and adrenal glands. With immune suppression, such as seen in aging, with stress or trauma, these viruses can reactivate from one or more of these ganglionic neurons, travel outwards along neurites to the skin to produce a rash. So VZV reactivation typically produces herpes zoster or shingles. HSV1 reactivates typically from the trigeminal ganglia and will produce uh, uh, herpes labialis or cold sores. In addition, these viruses can travel along neurites to multiple organs to produce multi-organ disease with or without rash. Specifically, reactivation from the trigeminal ganglia or olfactory bulb, as well as the upper cervical ganglia, allows virus to travel along neurites to be deposited directly into the brain parenchyma and cerebral arteries. And this is what makes alpha herpes viruses unique amongst other pathogens because they have a direct immune privilege route to arteries in the brain. Uh, both VZV and HSV recapitulates many clinical histopathological features of Alzheimer's disease. And I just like to highlight that uh, like uh, Alzheimer's disease, VZV, is a, VZV reactivation is a disease of aging and that it can produce uh, chronic progressive uh, dimensions. Maria, this is Mac. We hear from some of the participants that they have a trouble hearing you. Um, can you can you um, can you increase your volume uh, and speak a little bit louder? Um, yes, I can speak a little bit louder. Thank you. I don't want to. Okay. All right. So, um, so uh, VZV and HSV1 recapitulates uh, clinical histopathological features of AD. And as I was saying, there's been several case reports of VZV presenting as a chronic progressive dementia. 
In addition, like Alzheimer's disease, uh, VZV can produce cerebrovascular disease, namely ischemia and hemorrhage of small, medium, and large vessels. Okay. So during our RNA-seq studies of VZV-infected adventitial fibroblasts, which were the first cells infected during VZV vasculopathy, we were surprised to find that infection-induced expression of amylin, which is islet amyloid polypeptide, and we also found that there was enrichment of pathways involved in Alzheimer's disease, namely amyloidosis, dementia, tauopathy, AD, and we had predicted upstream regulators, including APP, APOE, MAPT, PSEN, and IAPP. We saw similar results when we examined MOC and VZV-infected human sensory neurons. Uh, enriched pathways in the VZV-infected sensory neurons included Alzheimer's disease, amyloidosis, and entauopathy. Upstream regulators were APP, PSEN1, and TAU. Uh, and in addition, we saw enrichment of pathways suggestive of complement activation and synaptic pruning. We then did in vitro and in vivo studies to confirm these results using primary human cells and a rhesus macaque model. Using various cell types, we found that VZV infected cells, shown here in red, contained A beta 42, as well as amylin and amyloid by thioflavin T staining. Uh, A beta 42 amylin and thio T were not present in uninfected bystander cells or in the mock cultures. We also found that only VZV induced amylin expression, uh, HSV1 did not. When we knocked down amylin expression with siRNA shown here, we found that amylin knockdown decreased viral transcripts, suggesting that amylin has a proviral function. Okay, we then examined supernatant from VZV infected cells that were not infectious and did not contain elevated levels of A beta peptides or amylin. And we found that the supernatant from VZV infected cells, when spiked with amylin, or spiked with a beta induced aggregation of these cellular peptides. And this was not uh, seen to the same extent using mock supernatant, indicating that VZV infection produces a soluble factor that triggers cellular peptide aggregation. We identified amyloidogenic sequences in VZV glycoprotein B that may be this soluble factor and we synthesized uh, these regions of interest. And we found that these viral peptides could self-aggregate to form fibrils as shown here. We have a region of interest one derived from the VZV glycoprotein B peptide. It's self-aggregated to form amyloid fibrils on electron microscopy. And we also found that some of these fragments could catalyze misfolding of the cellular amylin and A beta 42 peptides in a dose dependent manner. And so there's more details of this in um, Andrew Bubak's paper in the Journal of Infectious Disease. So I'd just like to highlight with increasing amounts of region of interest one shown here uh, in panel D red, uh, we could see that there is enhanced uh, detection of amyloid fibrils uh, with the same amount of A beta 42. All right, so given the findings that VZV infection of vascular cells in vitro produced intracellular amyloid, we examined cerebral amyloid angiopathy arteries, which are seen in AD brains. We found that in some of these arteries that contain beta amyloid, shown here in blue in K and L, viral antigen was also present in the same regions. And we confirmed this viral antigen by scraping these sections, extracting DNA, and amplifying VZV DNA by PCR. We then examined patients with VZV infection. Compared to matched control plasma, plasma from acute zoster patients contained elevated levels of amyloid. And these levels of amyloid positively correlated with A beta 42 and amylin in the zoster plasma, supporting a virus induced peripheral 
amyloidogenic environment during zoster. Similarly, we compared stroke control CSF and found that the CSF from BZV vasculopathy patients had elevated levels of amyloid shown here in panel A blue, elevated levels of amylin shown here, and the levels of amyloid in the BZV vasculopathy cerebrospinal fluid positively correlated with the amount of anti-BZV antibodies as well as the amount of amylin. Again, supporting a virus-induced amyloidogenic central nervous system environment. Finally, we examined simian varicella virus-infected rhesus macaques. And SVV is the VZV homologue in non-human primates. It produces varicella on primary infection, establishes latency in ganglionic neurons, and reactivates to produce zoster with immune suppression. So figure B here uh, shows a representative monkey with varicella, rash here, uh, following intrathecal, uh, intratracheal inoculation of SVV. We find that in association with viremia at days four and nine uh, post-infection, there is elevations in the serum amylin and serum amyloid in these animals. And these studies are still ongoing. Uh, we need to examine what happens during latency, reactivation, and several months after reactivation. We've begun to examine infected tissue uh, in these rhesus macaques. And we found that SVV infects the pancreas. So these are one, the, one of the tissues where we've completed analysis on. We see SVV antigen in panel B in brown within pancreatic islets. And the blue staining are the insulin producing beta cells. We find that in the SVV infected animals that have varicella, amyloid is also present in the infected pancreas. Amyloid is not present in normal pancreas and our positive control diabetic pancreas contains amyloid shown here. And so we're currently, as I said, still analyzing time points after primary infection through latency and zoster and analysis of multiple tissues are still ongoing. So with a recent NIA-AD supplement, we collected paired serum and cerebrospinal fluid during the course of SVV infection to determine if a peripheral disease or um, a disease that manifests as a rash can affect the central nervous system. And so this is just data for prelim analysis of two animals, and we see throughout the course of infection, primary infection, latency, zoster, and post-zoster, that in the cerebrospinal fluid, these animals have elevations in A-beta-42 associated with primary infection, and then elevations in A-beta-42 in the CSF a few weeks following zoster. Similarly, we see- Just two more minutes. Peripheral- Okay. Similarly, we see in this uh, rash elevations in interleukin-6 and in zoster. So the summary for this portion of the talk is that HSV and BZV shares many features of AD. BZV infection produces amylin and amyloid and triggers an amyloidogenic environment. And in rhesus macaques, uh, we had these very fascinating findings. Okay. So finally, we wanted to look at the viral effects uh, in the olfactory system. And this was done in collaboration with Dr. Diego Restrepo. In a parallel body of literature, early AD is characterized by smell loss, amyloid deposition, and OSN dysfunction. And because sniff-induced gamma oscillations generated in the bulb are coupled with hippocampus, smell loss results in decreased hippocampal gamma oscillations that's been postulated to lead to neurodegeneration and cognitive decline. So given that HSV and BZV can infect the olfactory epithelium via reactivation from trigeminal ganglion bulb, and that they can produce smell loss, we hypothesized that alpha herpes virus infection, the OE, 
triggers pathological processes characteristic of early AD. And so we first want to determine if there was evidence of viral infection in olfactory tissue of AD patients. And we obtained FAD tissue samples from our collaborators in Columbia from this group. We used a powerful targeted RNA sequencing technology, BioSpider Tempo C, that allowed us to scrape the bulb and tracks from FFPE slides and conduct RNA seq in a three day assay. And we found that compared to matched controls, we that the olfactory bulb of FAD patients had enrichment of pathways involved in viral infection and the olfactory tract had enrichment of pathways involved in inflammation. And so this encouraged us to submit a grant and now we submit a grant further exploring this hypothesis in which we'll uh, conduct targeted RNA-seq on a larger group of patients. We'll determine whether infection of the olfactory epithelium cultures uh, can produce amyloid and uh, odor lo uh, loss of odor responsiveness. And finally, we'll test whether intranasal infection with HSV1 can worsen olfactory dysfunction, accelerating the AD phenotype, and whether uh, gamma entrainment can uh, decrease that hippocampal dysfunction. So uh, this is my summary of what I've showed you. And you can see from my talk that we have multiple opportunities and challenges. There are multiple mechanisms where, where pathogens uh, can contribute to AD pathologies, yet this poses multiple challenges in integrating how these pathogens contribute to progression and where we would intervene therapeutically. So finally, I'd like to thank members of my lab, my collaborators, and the NIH for funding. Thank you. Thank you. That was a terrific talk. All right. It's 1.45. We have a set of last uh, three talks. Dr. Knapp, please. All right, thank you. Okay, so we can go ahead and get started again. Um, the next talk is um, by two people together. Um, so we have Timothy Crowther and um, Maya Koroyo um, Amoy. I hope I didn't butcher your last name, my apologies. <laughs> And you're going to talk about effects of chlamydia and ammonia infection in brain and retina in Alzheimer's disease. So if you would, I wouldn't mind introducing yourself and saying a couple things about yourself and your expertise, that would be good. Hi. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting us to present this. Um, just to be clear, I've, not, I've never done Alzheimer's research before. I'm very new to this field. I have spent a lot of time uh, investigating immune responses to chlamydia and ammonia infection. Uh, and how it relates to other chronic inflammatory diseases such as asthma, atherosclerosis, and lung fibrosis. And when the NIA started asking about uh, research into infection and Alzheimer's, I got very excited about this. And so I reached out to uh, one of my colleagues, Dr. Coronio, who does know Alzheimer's very well and who has pioneered the um, non-invasive imaging of the retina as a window into Alzheimer's where you can uh, monitor uh, uh, A-beta plaques. And we uh, submitted a R01 application with the recent RFA, and I'm happy to say we, we just got funded. So uh, I'm very excited. Now, this talk's gonna be light on data because we haven't really started yet. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about, about chlamydia pneumonia and Alzheimer's. I'm gonna tell you what we plan to do in this grant and the tiny bit of preliminary data we generated uh, for this grant. So I don't really need to go over the slide. Really, I've decided, everybody knows. Uh, I just wanna point out that Dr. Oscar Fisher one of the fathers of Alzheimer's, uh, firmly believed in an infectious ideology of Alzheimer's. And unfortunately, when the importance of uh, amyloid was found, his work was basically completely lost for about 70 years. So chlamydia pneumoniae, it's a common uh, obligatory uh, intracellular uh, respiratory pathogen. It can lead to community acquired pneumonia. Most people will become seropositive for chlamydia at some time in their life. The gram-negative bacterium possesses type 3 secretion. Unfortunately, there's only limited genetics to manipulate it. Uh, it reproduces in macrophages, neutrophils, epithelial cells mainly. And it has been for a long time associated with diseases of chronic inflammation, such as asthma, COPD, atherosclerosis, Alzheimer's, and others. So chlamydia pneumonia has a very unique life cycle. It starts as a 
non, basically non-metabolically active elementary body that gets taken up by the cell. Then an inclusion is formed, which will not fuse with the lysosome. And the elementary body will then change to the reticulate body, which is active and rapidly multiplies. And then uh, as this goes on, and eventually they convert back to uh, elementary bodies and burst forth, forth in the cell. This takes about uh, three days, basically. I want to point out that sometimes this pathway doesn't quite work, like, work right, and you get more of a persistent infection that's very poorly understood. On the right, oops, let's see. Sorry about that. And on the right, you can see this is a typical staining for chlamydia inclusions at about 70 hours uh, infected uh, uh, HEP2 cells. You can see these are very large inclusions in these cells. But if you looked in a macrophage, these inclusions are much smaller. So over the years, I've done a lot of research uh, investigating a chlamydia and how the immune system responds to it. We've uh, looked at TLR4 and TLR2, both uh, important. Uh, both NOD1 and NOD2 respond to peptidoglycan in chlamydia. We know importantly that chlamydia activates the NLRP3 inflammasome. Um, uh, this is very important. The uh, R1-beta is critical in controlling infection. We also know now that the inflammasome uh, may play a role in Alzheimer's. And I want to point out that uh, uh, chlamydia also induces both CD4 and CD8 T cell responses. And I want to point out these TH17 responses, while uh, the T17 T cells play absolutely no role in clearing chlamydia from infection. They do; they can lead to a, a, a pathogenic uh, a fibrotic response later on. So, as I mentioned before, chlamydia has been associated with many uh, chronic inflammatory diseases, and in the in bold are so the, the most well associated: asthma and atherosclerosis and Alzheimer's. I want to point out uh, briefly uh, atherosclerosis. Uh, researchers were very excited about this uh, uh, correlation uh, in the 90s. A lot of uh, research was done, many mouse studies that all showed clear acceleration of atherosclerosis due to chlamydia infection. Unfortunately, a uh, hastily devised a clinical trial was performed where uh, antibiotics were given for several months to patients, and uh, they then saw no effect on atherosclerosis. So this is not surprising, especially some of the discussions we've had yesterday given that when were you infected with chlamydia? Is it still having an effect right now? So you can't just give somebody antibiotics for, for a couple months and expect to see a result when maybe you were infected 20 years ago. So uh, there is a bit of data out there uh, supporting chlamydia pneumonia and Alzheimer's disease. And I wanna point out that a lot of this work was done by Brian Balin and Alan Hudson. I think Brian Balin is here today. Um, they have found uh, chlamydia DNA and RNA and proteins in human AD brains. Uh, chlamydia anti-CP titers are increased in Alzheimer patients. Chlamydia has actually been successfully cultured from uh, a couple different Alzheimer brains. Uh, the chlamydia load during infection is actually linked to the APOE4 allele. It is higher if you have the APOE4 allele. And uh, chlamydia infection complications have been linked to the prognosis of dementia. Regarding mouse data, uh, there's not as much. Uh, there have been no studies in actually uh, uh, Alzheimer mice, something that we hope to fix. Uh, but we have, uh, has been shown that a chlamydia can be found in the brains of wild type infected mice and that these infections can increase uh, amyloid plaques in these mice. So when you talk about uh, chlamydia pneumonia and Alzheimer's, uh, there are several different routes of possible mechanisms that uh, mode of action, uh, how it's gonna uh, affect Alzheimer's and none of these uh, uh, different routes exclude the other, more likely they're all involved. But if we look at, uh, Systemic inflammation, you get a, a lung infection with chlamydia. This uh, leads to a strong cytokine response that can travel throughout the body, including uh, into the brain, causing a local inflammation there. Uh, then you have the Trojan horse, horse uh, uh, mechanism, which again, you have a lung infection. And these uh, chlamydia can then be taken up by immune cells, which uh, then with uh, uh, a broken down uh, BVB can travel uh, to the brain causing a, uh, again, local inflammation. And finally, chlamydia off also can uh, go through a direct route uh, via the nose uh, directly causing a uh, inflammation. So as again, none of these routes uh, exclude the other and more likely if chlamydia does play a role, uh, all these may be involved. So let's go right to our grant, what we're proposing to do because uh, 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 very little is known. Uh, so we decided we have to do a lot of basics here. 
uh, using the uh, 80 transgenic mice, uh, we're going to be looking at chronic infection versus acute infection. We're going to be looking at the timing, that is, if we uh, sacrifice mice shortly after infection versus letting it go for a long term. Since we can control uh, when you're being infected, the mice are being infected, we're going to do an antibiotic approach where giving antibiotics right after what, right after infection versus again, after a longer term to see if there's any difference. We'll also be taking an omics approach uh, to see directly what's happening in the brain during a chlamydia infection, both acute and chronically. And this is a simple uh, a schematic of a typical uh, uh, model we're gonna be using. Uh, initially, we'll be using a uh, model that was developed for atherosclerosis where the mice received three very low dose infections uh, intranasally, and then we let these mice age out. As I mentioned, uh, Dr. Cronio has, has uh, pioneered uh, retinal imaging and we can do this non-invasively. So, as you can see on the right, there's an example of looking at amyloid plaques in the retina. So we can monitor the progress over time. So we're very excited to get started about this. So sort of the mechanistic studies we're gonna be looking at. I mentioned that uh, chlamydia can, induces the inflammasome and it's a very important pathway. Uh, we all now know that the uh, NLP3 inflammasome may play an important role in Alzheimer's. So we're gonna look at chlamydia's role and its interaction with the inflammasome in the brain. We're going to be uh, generating, uh, we have now three flocks mice breeding with uh, lysum mice, so it's myeloid uh, knockout for NALP3. And we will make bone marrow chimeras onto our transgenic mice and look at the effects with and without infection. We'll also investigate a treatment route with MCC950, which is a, a, a specific NLRP3 inhibitor. Furthermore, I mentioned that chlamydia pneumonia can induce aberrant uh, TH17 responses. Uh, so we're also gonna look at that as there's some evidence that uh, TH17 T cells may play a role in Alzheimer's. Um, we're gonna be using initially uh, antibody depletion models for IL-17A and IL-23, but we've also developed a, a, a model of TH17 infl uh, inflammation where if you knock out RIP2 specifically in T cells, this leads to enhanced pathogenic TH17 responses. And we're gonna be generating these mice as a, a bone marrow chimera onto uh, to the AD transgenic mice to look at the role with and without infection, the role of TH17 T cells in Alzheimer's. So we should get data both ways. Finally, uh, we, do, we will do a few human studies. Um, uh, Dr. Cronio has a, a very beautifully matched brain and retina samples. So we're gonna be taking these samples and uh, probing for chlamydia antigens and the NLP3 inflammasome and see if we can see any correlations and associations there. So as I said, we did generate a little bit of preliminary data. Um, this is just a, a infected mouse lungs with chlamydia and we probed for uh, A-beta-42 just to see if uh, the mice make a robust A-beta response to chlamydia infection. And as you can see very clearly, uh, uh, there's a, a huge response, at least locally, uh, to the infection uh, producing A-beta-42 to chlamydia. We were able to perform a very quick uh, trial study uh, for the proposal where we infected six month old uh, transgenic mice and then we sacrificed them one month later so it was sort of a short time point. And it just, uh, there's a control there to show the chlamydia staining in the lung of an infected mouse versus an uninfected. And we were able to observe in the brain chlamydia antigens. And then uh, uh, we noticed they were in close proximity to uh, uh, microglia cells and in A beta deposition. So we're very excited about that. I do want to point out that in this study, we observed a uh, reduction in soluble ABA42 and a trend in reduction in the insoluble ABA42 in the brain. And uh, this doesn't really go against our hypothesis because we're, this was a short time point. And we uh, actually think that there's a good possibility that right after uh, acute infection, uh, there may be a, a decrease in amyloid due to activated macrophages. And I wanna also point out based on some of the discussions we've had earlier today, that uh, uh, initial chlamydia infection induces a large amount of IL-12 and interferon gamma. So this all may play a role in the short term. And in our studies, we'll be doing both short-term and very long-term studies to see what kind of differences. Uh, as I mentioned, we're gonna be looking at the inflammasome and one of the main ways to look for inflammasome activity is visualizing aspects, which are part of the inflammasome uh, uh, component structure. And so this is just a quick uh, uh, look at, at these infected mice, uh, uninfected and completely infected transgenic mice. And we could observe uh, uh, aspects in these animals. It's a proof of concept. 
yeah, if that's all the data we have, we're excited to get started. Uh, uh, this has been you know, a great opportunity. And I just want to also point out that uh, with this new study, uh, we do have some open postdoctoral positions. So thank you. Thanks very much. Yeah, very exciting data. <laughs> okay, let's move on to the next presentation. Um, so Mac, how many minutes do we have for the um, discussion now? Thank you, Svetlana. Uh, doc, thank you, Dr. Nath. We um, we have a half an hour to to moderate a discussion. Uh, this could be half an hour. This could be fifteen minutes, depending uh, uh, how many questions we have. I encourage uh, panelists to ask questions. We are monitoring uh, chat, um, so perhaps we can chat with this. Uh, we can start with the chat if if you wish, uh, Dr. Nath. Okay. Sure. So I've been looking at the uh, and the chat box has been very active. So uh, Dr. Nath, actually, good. there are colleagues. Huh. There are colleagues monitoring. So if you obviously you can you can pick up the question from from the chat, or we can ask our colleagues who are monitoring constantly oh, okay. monitoring okay. the chat yes. okay. to pose that question. Oh, okay, that would be wonderful. Why don't I start with the first one and then I'll let your colleagues take over from there? So it's looking at the at the chat box, as well as the Q&A session, there seems to be one overarching question, I think, and I would value the opinion of um, the panelists here. And that is, uh, you know, you have a lot of microorganisms now that have been associated with Alzheimer's and you can just pick anyone you want, all kinds of viruses, bacteria, fungi, and everything in between. So, and each one of them seems to be, you can find it in the brain, you can find it in the periphery, and so there's no one overarching cause for Alzheimer's as far as the microbiome is concerned. Um, so how do we put it all together? Is it possible that the, the primary defect is really in the immune system and then all these things are accumulating? Or do you think that there is more to it and that each of these are the multiple etiologies and Alzheimer's is just like fever and you can have multiple organisms that can cause fever? Um, so I was wondering if the panelists would like to address this question first, and then we can open it up to more specific questions for each individual. Uh, if I may, um, yeah, I mean, hey, to me, this uh, whole symposium and, and then having everybody talking about this uh, infectious etiology really opened uh, a completely, uh, well, I don't know if I call it Pandora's box, but a new box in terms of research, because I think that historically we have always thought that the brain is this pristine, sterile, perfect uh, reservoir that uh, nothing gets in. And I think we're beginning to realize that there's quite a few things that could get in. But I mean, obviously we have a pretty robust also immune system that before also the idea that there was not much immune function in the brain. So I, I think that we're just beginning to realize that in, indeed, uh, as some have mentioned before, there is a brain microbiome uh, that, that maybe is somewhat dormant, but with aging, aging mechanisms or disease mechanisms like Alzheimer's might become, um, might become uh, activated. And we could see these either interactions with the neurodegenerative disorders or triggering neurodegenerative disease. The other thing that I also want to mention is that uh, Alzheimer, we now recognize is a heterogeneous disorder. Not all Alzheimer diseases are created equal. So I think these heterogeneity of uh, pathogens could somewhat correlate with heterogeneity in AD and ADRD and uh, with different immunological responses, genetics, aging mechanisms. I, I, I think it, a lot of work to do and food for thought. Well, excellent comments. So uh, maybe we can go down to some of the other uh, speakers. You wanted to address the same issue and maybe have additional comments to give and we can do it in the order of the presentations that were made. So uh, Maria, do you have any additional comments? Um, yeah, I think it's going to be really complex, and the only thing we can do is chip away at all the separate mechanisms and then try to put it together as we uh, get more information, because this field and the funding for this field is, is still pretty early. Um, with regards to immune dysfunction, 
we know that then that in turn can reactivate latent viruses, you know, mm -hmm. increase your predisposition to infection. So it's, it's hard to, to say that it's only immune dysfunction that's the main contributor. Yeah, so it's the chicken and the egg story, you know, you have one worse than the other. All right, great. Um, Chris, you have any additional comments you'd like to make? Uh, you're muted. Uh, no, sorry. <laughs> oh, okay. No, that's fine. Uh, and and uh, Timothy, do you want to say anything? Um, I guess you're... I don't see your video on, so probably not. Okay. And really what about, uh, okay. yeah. Okay. And uh, David, did you want to make any additional comments? No. David, Corey, no. Uh, so I think uh, just regarding my own presentation, so there, there, there is a, a comment that's, that's coming back and it's highly predictable. It's worth, I think, addressing a little bit more detail. And the issue is, if you're going to be culturing human brain and, and Lord knows what other tissue from autopsy, so you got to be worried about contamination. Yes. So I just want to maybe address that with a few points. Mm -hmm. the, the predominant organism that we're getting is an incredibly special sort of, I think it's unprecedented. It's, it's a biofilm, uh, which has been noted with Canada, but it's never been shown to my knowledge from human brain. Um, it is, you cannot create this infection in the laboratory. You cannot mix bacteria with fungi and get a lichenoid. Um, furthermore, you can break up a lichenoid so that the fungal and the bacterial elements are separate and now replate that and you can never, you can get the bacterium to grow, but you can't get the fungus to grow. The Canada has, is now in a transcriptional state that it cannot grow without the, without the bacterium as its companion in that matrix. So otherwise, you know, what else are you going to get in, in, a, in an autopsy sample? You're going to get translocation of bacteria and fungi coming from whatever proximal source that might be for the brain. Maybe it's from the sinus, maybe it's from uh, the oral cavity. But anyway, that microbiome is highly predictable. It's stochastic, so it's random kind of what kind of bacteria and other contaminants you might get. We don't get any of that. This is not a stochastic finding that we are getting. It is a highly specific thing with a very unusual, possibly unprecedented type of infection that's almost impossible to be the result of contamination. Furthermore, these lichenoids do not exist in the environment. You can't swab a surface in, a, in an autopsy room and get this, this thing to grow out. So we do think it's, it, it is the real deal. Um, but, you know, but there's always going to be room for doubt. And, and I, I certainly understand that. And we'll continue to work to, to try to understand just exactly how specific uh, this kind of thing is. So yeah, it, yeah, I mean, that's very reassuring. I mean, the issue about contamination crossed my mind as well. I mean, if you ever visited an autopsy suite, I mean, it's uh, terrible. <laughs> you have one body after another, the DNA oh, yeah. cuts and stuff. You want, you go in, I want the brain. You say, well, it's sitting in that bucket with all the intestines and everything in there. You know, you can exactly. pick out whatever you want. <laughs> we work very carefully with our pathologists. So we're using sterile technique to obtain um, everything. Yeah, yeah. So I think that's the key part is the way you collect the tissue is everything. Because the knives that you cut the and the, the dinner uses and all the kind of the table that you use is just all full of microbiome. I bet the air circulation there, unless you're working in a level three autopsy suite, is probably you could culture almost anything out of the air. So, uh, so those uh, issues are certainly very important to keep in uh, consideration that uh, you make a good point. Okay. Tonight, there are several questions uh, for presenters from our colleagues monitoring chat. Okay. And there are also several requests from the audience to uh, join the panel discussion, ask the question, and perhaps mention their own data. So I don't know whether uh, we have time for this, but um, Rachel and, and Liz and Jean, please go ahead with question from audience. Uh, before we go to that, I see Dr. Tansy's and Dr. Noble's hands are up. Maybe you could go ahead and hear from them yes, first. Please. Uh, yes, please, go ahead. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I just wanted to um, say, you know, this has been an amazing conference, I think speaking for all of us, this is uh, clearly the most exciting and, and best conference I've been to all year. And just want to first thank you guys for putting this together because I think all of us are just kind of electrified with all these data and to have everyone together presenting such high quality data on what has otherwise been a controversial and fringe topic that usually gets, uh, you know, the uh, is on the bad end of a review, whether it's a grant or a paper, this is just great. 
And the other, I just want to make the observation that it seems like going across these, these talks is two pathways we're seeing. One is you have bad guy pathogens that can start in the periphery. And then as we get older, let's say immune system is down, the blood brain barrier gets leaky. These pathogens get in to the brain and trigger pathology. You know, we would say it triggers amyloid, uh, seeding amyloid deposition, Will Imer's data seeds tangles, and clearly it's seeding neuroinflammation causing uh, microglial activation neuroinflammation. So that's one side. But the other side is fascinating is on the vaccines being protective and um, seeing that a primed peripheral immune system is protective, seeing the, um, the, uh, um, the, the data on some pathogens that actually promote amyloid um, clearance, as Dr. Loden showed, it says that if, if we're priming the peripheral immune system in a more defensive manner, um, whether it's innate immune system or adaptive immune system, that's good for the brain. And I think that's where the big gap is. We can understand how pathogens can cause problems when they get in the brain. But how does a, a primed, pumped up peripheral immune system from a vaccine or adjuvant, or even just from a parasite or, 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 or microbe actually make good things happen in the brain if it stays in the periphery? And I, I just wanted to make that comment that it looks like there's two pathways we have to explore. Um, and it, I, I'm trying not to convolute them as I think about this and just wanted to share that. That's all, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Was there someone else who had their hand up? Yeah, uh, thank you. And uh, I echo Rudy's comments about this really being such an engaging and, uh, and uh, exciting conference. And just having been, you know, trying to apply for grants for this almost 15 years and having troubles in getting traction, I, I echo those same concerns. I, I wanted to comment on the question that was posed a few minutes ago about, you know, is this something we should focus on one organism or another? I think we've seen some pretty compelling, um, you know, presentations the last two days to suggest that it probably is not something we should dwell on one organism or another, but we're seeing fungi, we're seeing vir virides and, and, uh, and bacterium, um, you know, all sh suggesting that there's some sort of, uh, you know, common pathway engaging amyloid and inflammation. And I want to make sure we don't lose sight of that, that, you know, we, we're here today because we're embracing, you know, these, these uh, kind of outsider ideas, but coming together, they seem to make a lot of sense, even though they come from different, um, you know, uh, taxonomic uh, pathways. Um, I also want to emphasize that we're probably here at this date and not years ago because of dogma. And, and dogma is something we have to guard against because traditionally we think of Alzheimer's disease as being a sterile disease, right? We also think of it being one disease. It, it's, it's not diseases, although that phrase was posed about five or six years ago by Phil Gorelick, who was saying that maybe we're seeing you know, in, in phenotype in late age, something that looks very similar one patient to the next, although these are very different diseases overall. And I think the other dogma that we're trying to guard against or push back against is that in medical school, we're taught that people who have brain infections are hospitalized and we do lumbar punctures on them when we treat them when they're hospitalized. And we're not seeing that here. We're seeing a low grade chronic infection or, or at least a response to infection, maybe transient bacteremia, viremia, fungemia, or some sort of direct involvement that the brain is effective in, in protecting against. I just wanna applaud all my colleagues here on the panel. It's been a wonderful two days and thank you. Dr. Nath, uh, yeah. this is Mac again. Uh, just one quick housekeeping uh, note. Um, I think perhaps we should combine, if, if one looks at our agenda, moderated discussion, uh, synthesis by moderators and final discussion into that conversation, because I believe that that uh, final synthesis and final thoughts already started. So is it okay if we skip that 10 minutes break and continue our discussion about um, what we learn? Can we answer that questions? What are the knowledge gaps, priorities to address those gaps? Is that okay? Can we, yeah, can we con continue as uh, without the break with synthesis and, and the final discussion? If, it if that sounds is like a great idea to me. I'll be supportive. And if okay. anybody has any objections to that. So again, so let me remind you, we wanted to perhaps, uh, can, we, can we again ask the question, is there evidence or revisit the question, is there ev is evidence for causation? Can we ask uh, uh, questions, what are the 
knowledge gaps? What, what, what are the scientific priorities? What are we missing? What, what needs goes first? So again, um, uh, I would appreciate comments from the moderators, from all presenters. We are monitoring chat and we will be happy to elevate some um, colleagues to a panelist to continue with the discussion. So uh, Dr. Nath, so you were promoted as a key moderator and final uh, moderator for our discussion. Thank you. Oh, thank, thanks for the promotion. <laughs> <laughs> My pleasure. <laughs> Okay, so, so you bring up very important points for us to discuss. And I think you know, ultimately, although they're very specific questions for each of the uh, panel, each of the speakers, I think um, the bigger questions are probably more important and that is where are the scientific gaps and where do we need to go from here? So the first question may be that, um, do we need to look at each of these pathogens as potential etiologies? Are there um, specific phenotypes with each of the pathogens that may be associated with different forms of Alzheimer's disease? Are we looking at the same end product no matter what pathogen we start with? Um, is that a, uh, a reasonable question? Does anybody want to comment on it? I would like to comment a little bit on yes. um, a uh, couple of things. So I think overall it's pretty clear that many pathogens can, of course, uh, cause uh, neurodegeneration. And I think so far the reluctancy in the field was always like, oh, we don't have enough evidence for causation. But I think these last two days have been really amazing to see how much progress we've done, you know, how much progress is being made, um, published and about to be published. And I think we do have enough evidence that there is a causative um, component, but many, many different pathogens can result in, you know, uh, AV plaques, the position, or in tangle formation, or in tau phosphorylation, cognitive impairment. So perhaps uh, this is a good time to bring all of us together to see what are the common themes in different pathogens that can, you know, what is it overlapping in each of our models? And perhaps, of course, Dr. Tanzi's and the antimicrobial hypothesis is what is perhaps uh, overarching unifying thing that if you have that kind of antimicrobial response in the brain, that's going to be sufficient. Um, and maybe that's how we should uh, tackle it. Uh, I don't know. But I think we don't have enough evidence now that microbes can cause <laughs> Alzheimer's, I would say, at least in my in my mind. Oh, OK. I would comment if I, if I can. That... Yes, Maria. One of the things that we've really struggled with when we publish papers is reviewers don't like the word cause. Because when we say cause, we think that, you know, if I inject this pathogen into a mouse, then it's immediately going to produce disease. And maybe, so what we, we've been very cautious and we've been saying more, it's, there, it's yet another contributory factor taking into account the host or environmental factors. So we've seen a lot of resistance from the reviewers whenever we try to use that word cause. But the thing is that, you know, people forget historically that before the advent of penicillin, uh, syphilis was one of the major causes of dementia. And I don't really understand the resistance now in the AD field that there can be potentially an infectious contributor when historically there has been. I mean, there are infections. I mean, HIV is known to cause dementia. Um, I think everybody accepts that now, although yes. originally that was not the case. So yes, I mean, certain pathogens are overwhelmingly um, associated with uh, neurodegenerative diseases. I think um, here it's a bit challenging because if, you know, in the HIV brain, you look at the brain, you find HIV, you don't find CMV and other things. But here you're finding everything under the sun. So that becomes a challenge. Um, Dr. Nath, there is, uh, Dr. Itsaki has her hand up. All right. So, and Dr. Uh, Cox. Okay. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead. I think. Um, I was fascinated by the fungal talk and just wonder what the fungus is doing in the baby's brain. Um, but I think the view that we've seen these organisms in brain isn't quite accurate, isn't it? We've seen their effects. In many cases, the, the organism hasn't been looked for. 
But anyway, um, I really wanted to say just a very trivial point that um, it's amusing to see how much is discussed, has been discussed in these last two days, very interestingly. And I can only contrast it with the our findings of HSV1 in brain in 1991, where you can't imagine the odium that was heaped on us for that result. I wonder whether, um, I think it's now mostly gone, but um, it still exists. And uh, nice to think that so much, uh, so many people have got a sufficiently open mind to consider all these think, possibilities. Yeah, thanks very much for <laughs> mentioning that. I think that's very important. Okay, and who's next? Was it uh, Tim? You have your hand up. Yes, I, I just wondered if, uh, if there's any overarching differences between organisms that are mainly extracellular versus those that may hide uh, at low levels inside the cells in terms of amyloid production and, and the antimicrobial hypothesis, um, if they might actually have then a little bit of two different pathways there. And I just wanted to see if any other thoughts on that. Uh, so, uh, Tim, uh, that, that's a, a good point. I, I just throw out a couple of things about Canada. Um, so most people think of Canada as an extracellular pathogen, but there's good evidence from our lab, but, but, but there is evidence elsewhere. The Canada can exist intercellularly for actually for long periods of time, including in, uh, again, this, this group this, uh, of, of, of um, patholo neuropathologists in, in, in uh, Spain. So their data indicates that Canada, that Canada is existing intranuclearly even uh, in neurons in the central nervous system, as well as microglia and other cells. So um, it could be a bit of both, um, intracellular and extracellular. And when it comes to thinking about maybe eradicating this kind of infection, how are you going to do that? How are you going to use antifungals to kill a Canada that's living intracellularly? So there's some pretty difficult rows uh, to hoe there. Um, I, we have Dr. Cox hand up and then we'll follow up with Dr. Spira. Thanks. Great, thank you. So I think it, it's just been so impressive to see all of the different routes and, and pathogens. And I think that there is definitely strong evidence today. And I think what's really interesting to me and in, in some of the major knowledge gaps are what are the major portal of entry? What are the species specific or microbe or viral specific uh, interactions? Um, and are there actually um, multi-organism uh, uh, infections? And so um, uh, David Corey, your work was really impressive with the lichenoid forms. Um, as we know, the uh, poor dentition is a great portal of entry to the brain. We heard great work uh, uh, from two speakers on that today. Have you looked at um, anaerobes uh, in the bioform, uh, biofilm formation process uh, with your lichenoids? Hey, thanks, Laura. There yeah, could great. definitely be some great. organisms there. Great question. So what we're, all I can tell you now is we see a lot of different bacterial forms. We see from cocci to rods, these weird filaments is the one example that I showed you. The bacteria are in association with the Canada are all over the place in the human brain, not the mouse, but in the human brain. We're just waiting for our metagenomics folks to give us our freaking 16S data. I, I was desperate to have that sure. data. Are you, are you doing any of the cultivation anaerobically? And I'll also just quickly tag that. in there. Um, some of the really strange um, filamentous forms on, on the smaller scale, on the, the, the microbial level, uh, can be coming from uh, some of these fuse of bacteria that get into the brain. Yeah, the bacteria nucleatoms, the pointy ones, but uh, necrophorum can form these very strange shapes. Uh, and they're great biofilm uh, uh, sort of uh, nucleation factors. Completely agree with you. And so we, we, I can't tell you how desperate I am for that 16S and I will, I'll personally email you once we do <laughs> I just don't know today. I'm, we're obviously all trying to get all over that, but we're dependent on our micro, you know, microbiome folks. Okay, great. Very uh, interesting. Very exciting. Yeah. Good question. All right, Adam, now next. Yeah, hi. Uh, you know, uh, I agree. This has just been a terrific uh, set of talks. And one of the things that I'd like to mention is a lot of my work it focuses on sleep and Alzheimer's disease. Oh, yeah. And sleep disturbance was for a long time uh, believed to be a consequence of Alzheimer's disease, given the clinical, you know, just the clear clinical salience of sleep disturbance in people with advanced Alzheimer's disease. And it's taken some time, but now it's rising to the level of uh, being recognized quite broadly as a modifiable risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. I wouldn't be surprised if with a little more time, <laughs> we can move uh, infection along the same lines. I've seen, I've, uh, what I've seen in sleep has given me hope. 
Now, the other thing that I would mention about this in terms of gaps is something that I've seen in the sleep literature, where we've seen in sleep and AD, where we've seen at times very contradictory findings. And I think that what we see coming from an epidemiologic perspective is we're likely to see a lot of interactions uh, in different populations in which, uh, whether we're looking at different people with ge different genetic backgrounds, people with uh, you know, different levels of education, uh, you know, biological sex differences, et cetera. And I think that it's, it's never too early to start digging into you know, those sorts of interactions uh, in order to get some of the mud out of the water. That was my point. Thanks. Thank add you. to that, Avindra? Pardon me? Can I add to that? Yeah, please go right ahead. That, yeah, so Adam, it's really interesting. We started tracing um, where HSV-1 goes during intranasal HSV infection, and it goes directly into very specific subnuclei within the hypothalamus, including those involved in sleep regulation. So it raises the question whether HSV can establish latency in those very specific subnuclei like lateral hypothalamus, the DMH, um, and uh, reactivate without causing rash, but lead to disruptions in sleep uh, behavior, uh, appetite, um, uh, and other uh, hypothalamic mediated uh, activities. Oh, it's good to know. Can I add to I I would like to add to that, that this whole intranasal entry point is really important when you think about where Alzheimer's begins. And you know, going back to the mid 80s, tangles begin in the entorhinal cortex, right behind the olfactory bulb. And you get tangles in the entorhinal cortex. And then if you look at the terminals of the entorhinal cortex off the peripheral pathway, where they hit the molecular layer of the hippocampus, the dentate gyrus, that's the first place you see amyloid. And then neuroinflammation is induced in both areas after that. So you get this, in all of these can be thought of as innate immune uh, responses. So what if, you know, herpes or other viruses are first triggering tangles along with Will Imer's, you know, in the lines of Will Imer's work, the tangles are trying to block that neurotropic spread of the virus. And the virus that gets through at the other end of the synapse, that's driving amyloid deposition by seeding A-beta. And now both of these pathologies are starting to kill neurons and drive neuroinflammation. I mean, the nose is probably the, the best uh, bet given the temporal order of pathology and what we think these microbes are doing to trigger tangles and plaques. The nose would be the best bet for, 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 for the data regarding where Alzheimer's begins in the brain. So I just think it's important to point that out. Yeah, and thanks. Avi, maybe, maybe you might want to comment. I mean, you, you've been doing a lot of work on narrow COVID and I know we didn't include COVID on this uh, meeting this time because I guess still a lot of the data is coming yeah. but um, given the route of entry what Rudy was talking about the nose and what you've been working on uh, and the narrow COVID meeting we had recently with NIMH I know uh, you would like to comment something about that. Yes absolutely so I mean one of the difficulties in studying uh, nasal spread in human autopsy cases is that getting a hold of nasal mucosa is not that easy, especially if you want to get close to the cribriform plate. When you, the denar goes from above, it's hard to get it. You need a scope in order to go and get that mucosa. And I think that was one of the biggest challenges if you really want to look at uh, human nasal mucosa. Having said that, um, if there, um, at least with the coronaviruses, there is one coronavirus OC43, um, which if you put in the nose and you take a fluorescent virus and you can actually track it, going from the nose all the way down to the brainstem. There really is one synapse between the olfactory bulb and the brainstem. So it tracks really well, at least in rodents. And with the human coronavirus SARS-CoV-2, the problem is that you can get copious amounts of the virus coming out of the nose, but you go in the, into the brain, you can't find anything. And, um, but uh, yet there is pathology in the olfactory bulb. <laughs> so, um, uh, but there is no virus or if one or two people have found something but it's very, very little if they find anything. So is it possible that you really don't need the virus itself to go in there? There could be viral products that could trigger it. When viral replication takes place, at least um, very few of the viral proteins get incorporated into a virus. Large amounts of viral protein is produced and that protein is either degraded or it gets released extracellularly and it can transport transneuronally too. 
So one can possibility. I make, can I make a comment, a quick comment on that? Sorry to interrupt. Uh, most I am a nasal immunology, a nasal immunity person, so I didn't talk about anything like that. But most of the work, or my, a lot of the work that we do in my lab, is basically uh, trying to show how peripheral detection of viruses and other pathogens in the olfactory epithelium actually shapes the brain, despite the fact that there's not an active viral invasion in the brain. So we've shown how. Detection of a virus in the olfactory epithelium triggers immune responses, for instance, in the olfactory bulb, as well as changes in neurons and uh, neuronal circuits um, by single cell. We, we have all of the work about to be published at the single cell level, but we, we've published some of it. So I think in terms of COVID, it's clear that if, despite the fact that something or most of it can happen in the periphery, you're going to have changes in neuronal circuits in the CNS just from signals sent from the neurons that are, you know, reaching to the to the CNS directly through the olfactory route. So there's a lot of stuff to be learned about just how peripheral detection of pathogens in the olfactory CNS access is shaping neuronal function and behavior and cognitive yeah. function. Thanks so. for that input. Uh, clearly, you don't need the entire virus to go through and there are multiple mechanisms through which uh, that can potentially happen. Yeah, thanks. We also have Dr. Reedhead and Dr. Noble's hand up again. So uh, we might want to hear from them whenever we get a chance. Uh, so uh, Benjamin Reedhead, do you want to go first? Uh, thanks, Avi. Yeah, um, I, I, I just wanted to comment on, you know, what, what I think are one of the main data gaps, um, you know, particularly uh, to the extent that I might be able to help inform these questions of causality. And, and one of the big gaps that I think are present, there are many, um, is a relative paucity of micro relevant phenotypes that we routinely capture in our longitudinal data sets. You know, so electronic health records, you know, really they're, they're, they're optimized for acute care and for billing considerations. And you know, there's, I think there's very much an artifact of we capture what's capturable and you know, we've got you know, maybe some decent coverage of infections like HSV1 and, and others, but you know, the, 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 there's a big blank space in terms of other microbial perturbations that we'd love to have access to and, um, you know, could really inform, uh, you know, our hypothesis generation. Um, and I'm not saying this because I think it's a trivial problem to solve. I think there are some emerging technologies that I think could be helpful here. You know, things like antibody epitope repertoire analysis, particularly if it's done longitudinally and kind of earlier in the lifespan. Um, but to the extent that we can solve this as a problem or begin to solve it, um, I think we'll have access to a much broader set of data science approaches that we could use to generate hypotheses. And, you know, we can begin thinking about integrating genetics with these sorts of phenotypes so we can then open the door to kind of causality testing and Mendelian randomization so we can kind of get at what's driving what. Um, you know, we can use it to help, um, you know, design our experiments, identify the right biomarkers that we should be tagging in, you know, when, when we go to the wet lab. Um, so I just wanted to mention that as you know, one of the things I see as a major bottleneck at the moment. Yeah, that's a very important point. Thank you. Um, Rukunab, there is a lot of questions in the audience. So and and perhaps we can um, we can let them uh, on the forum. And can we have Dr. Noble first, and then uh, I just we'll uh, one, one comment to Ben. What you just said, uh, you know, most people don't have dental insurance, so administrative records around dental care is actually quite lacking too. I wanted to pose a question to the group. Uh, you know, Rudy commented about intranasal uh, introduction of of uh, various germs, but you know, should we be in including this conversation? Um, you know, this notion that uh, synucleinopathies may relate to um, you know a vagal transmission. Uh, from the gut. I mean, this is, there's a pretty compelling literature out there uh, associating with both uh, Parkinsonism and, you know, uh, uh, idiopathic Parkinson's disease and, and Lewy body disease uh, between appendectomies and, um, and uh, uh, stomach um, uh, uh, vagotomies for, uh, for ulcers. Uh, and there are some basic pathophysiological uh, linkages as well. I mean, is this, is this a part of the argument we should be considering as well? It's not what I do, but I wonder if others are. If I can piggyback on that, one of the questions that I had that I didn't ask after your talk um, was actually, uh, Dr. Noble, was actually about this gut-brain access communication that, pro that could provide a, a mechanism uh, for communication between the gut microbiome and the brain. Is there any other possibility, is there a possibility for such communication in the mouth? <laughs> There's not a, an oral brain access to speak of. Is there? 
Yeah, no, there actually is. Uh, there have been ah. some, there, there have been some proposals that there may be some translocation through the mandibular nerve. Uh, I haven't seen that myself, but there also may be some you know lymphatic or glymphatic transmission within the head, uh, and as well as any germs that are in the oral cavity may get up into the nose as well. It's all connected. Um, I, I think that's maybe an oversimplification, but certainly um, that's one possibility. I think the prevailing notion is that. Uh, uh, if periodontal germs are implicated in, in Alzheimer's disease, it's probably through hematogenous uh, spread, just because bacteremia is so common. Um, and, and as I, I put, I was chatting with somebody else here earlier today. I mean, it's like I said, it's somewhere between uh, 10 and 25 percent of people will have bacteremia just after uh, brushing and flossing. And especially if you don't take care of your teeth, you're much, much more likely to have that, even on routine daily care. Well, I, I would just say that the, the gut-brain axis, the microbiome folks have had a much better advertising team compared to the other fields that we're talking about here. So some, uh, some lessons to learn, perhaps. Well, they got it much longer in size. And, I'll, but, uh, I'll just say, you know, as a, as a gut microbiome person, even though people hear about the gut-brain axis, thinking about basic clinical microbiology, the number one cause of brain abscesses is um, microbes from, from the oral cavity. So it definitely is an important site. Yeah, I have a gut feeling that all roads lead to Rome. Yeah, you know, <laughs> it doesn't matter where you start, you end up in the brain. Okay, uh, all right. So you wanted to go to some of the chat questions, Mac. Uh, how, do we, how do we handle those? Yeah, so we had a specific question for Dr. Maslia, and then basically I think what we plan on doing is opening it up to those attendees that have been raising their hands, um, just emphasizing that um, we are under some time limitations. So please limit your discussion to you know, be very brief. So let me ask Dr. Maslia's question as we work to elevate the attendees. Um, are there any data illustrating differential levels of AB or of phospho tau as a function of art or art interruptions in hand or HIV models? Yeah, the, <clears throat> there is some in vitro data, particularly with antiretrovirals showing uh, inhibition of uh, APP uh, uh, degradation and also uh, A beta phagocytosis. Uh, there is also some data in vitro on uh, tau phosphorylation, but uh, I, I don't think we have good uh, in vivo data on, on that respect. I think that uh, more work is needed there. And I don't know, Abby, if you want to comment, I mean, that's an area that you also been working on. And I think you're absolutely right. Um, all these factors could be very important. Uh, okay, there, what's the next question? Questions? So I believe we've um, elevated now uh, Dr. Lapidus. Yes, uh, hold one second here. Um, I'm uh, Jeff Lapidus from Drexel University College of Medicine. I'd just like to take uh, a minute or less, hopefully, to tell you some new results that are um, consistent with a lot of what people have been saying. We've been studying the brain microbiomes of uh, about 30 Alzheimer's and control subjects. My colleague, Eve Monet, is also here with me, and we work in the lab of uh, Dr. Er Garth Ehrlich at, at Drexel. Um, I'll post my email address if anybody um, wishes to uh, ask us more. We're finishing an article that will report findings of a relationship between a particular polymicrobial ecosystem and Alzheimer's. We looked at bacteria only, not, not um, uh, fungi. Uh, in addition, using certain assumptions, we can piece together a bacterial etiology of the disease, uh, even though our samples were only taken at uh, one time from deceased subjects. Um, the poly polymicrobial system is present in almost all of the AD subjects and almost none of the controls. Um, uh, we would not get the results that we have gotten without advances in sequencing technology and bioinformatics. We use PacBio uh, long reach technology and a new um, microbial identification pipeline to provide high fidelity species level data. And we use some new bioinformatic techniques uh, appropriate to seeing ecosystems to analyze the data. 
So uh, we're very excited about this, and um, we think it's, it's it's very consistent. For example, with Dr. Tanzi's um, um, theories. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Uh, who's next? I think we've also elevated. Oh, Mac, you have your hand raised. No, I, I just wanted to. Uh, I, I wonder whether Dr. Devanand is on uh, is still at the audience. Because uh, there is an ongoing clinical trials, um, and we we didn't ask Dr. Devanan to present because I believe that trial is still ongoing. But um, perhaps if he is still um, in the audience, perhaps he can comment on that ongoing trial. So if you are still in uh, the, the audience, yeah, he's not. Read? Okay. Yeah, he's not present. Yeah. Um, Thank you so much. Um, I believe we now um, have Dr. Torch. I don't see Dr. Torch here. Um, yeah. Uh, there we go. Okay. Yeah. There we go. Hi, uh, Dr. Torch here. Uh, am I on? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, yesterday, I, I I alerted the panel and uh, Mac about the work that I had done on transneuronal degeneration with Dr. Aso Hirano, who is famed for his work on Hirano bodies way back in 1977 to 79. And since that time, I've continued on my work looking at the occurrence of transneuronal degeneration not only following stroke, which was the focus of the original article, but on uh, encephalitis, uh, trauma uh, due to chronic traumatic encephal associated with chronic traumatic encephalopathy, uh, as well as toxic metabolic disorders in adults and children. I am an adult and pediatric neurologist and also a sleep doc. And um, in my original paper and all the subsequent work that I've been do doing, I've been mapping out the transneuronal degeneration process in focal uh, diseases where we have unilateral or bilateral strokes in the hippocampus in particular with progressive transsynaptic degeneration throughout the entire PAPE system into the mammillary body, mammothalamic tract, all the way into the, the cingulate gyrus. So the question is, I mean, I was absolutely amazed to hear all the data on infection and I totally agree uh, with the, the, the concept now that we're dealing not with a specific disease. I don't believe that Alzheimer's disease is a disease. I think it's a syndrome caused by a multiplicity of many diseases, whether it's due to stroke, trauma, sleep apnea with hypoxemia, um, toxins in the environment. Now, the question is, where does transneuronal degeneration come into the picture once we have a focal or a multifocal or diffuse involvement of the brain through any of the noxious elements that were talked about in this uh, uh, infectious, uh, uh, you know, predominantly infectious related uh, symposium. Um, and then bringing up the, the fact that we need to find a model in living people uh, in living persons that have Alzheimer's disease to track the chronicity and the progression, what models do we have um, available other than the neuropathological autopsy materials? And, and to that effect, I've also been tabulating uh, uh, MRI, CT, and DTI uh, findings in living patients with progressive dementia in stroke, in encephalitis, uh, and as well as in children uh, with um, some of the older titles of dementia infantilis that were listed years and years ago in the early 1900s uh, by German and Italian researchers who, were, who did not have any idea of what the brain, how the brain was structured and what all the tracts are. Now we have at our hands, we've got PET scanning, MRI, CT, uh, on and on and on to study progression in the disease. And specifically with infection, yes, we can have viruses and fungi, um, 
uh, including uh, the current situation with COVID affecting different parts of the brain, like the hippocampus, specifically with, uh, with uh, herpes simplex as an example, or you can have diffuse seeding of the brain with dormant viruses that are not having any clinical expression until some uh, event that uh, adds to the whole process. So how do we dissect out the, the, the transneuronal uh, processes which in themselves can lead to symptoms of dementia, hypothalamic abnormalities, sleep abnormalities, and, and behavioral ab abnormalities, including temporal lobe epilepsy and schizophrenia. And I bring up that uh, in relation to the old concept of dementia uh, precox, which was a combination of psychiatric schizophrenic progression uh, with uh, evolving dementia in, in mentally housed individuals uh, that presented with Kraepelin's idea idea of dementia precox. And now we have dementia pugilistica and dementia this and dementia that. Uh, and so I'm raising this question. To I think that's a very important question that you bring in, up. In the panel. Um, yeah, no, thanks very much. So I think just to summarize that, I think the major question you're asking is that what's the mechanism of transneuronal uh, death? And that occurs in a variety of neurodegenerative diseases, not just Alzheimer's. Uh, but that could be fundamental to a uh, number of diseases, including here. Thank you for that question. Okay, now who's next? So, uh, Dr. Oh. Yeah, Dr. Volsky. Yeah, David Volsky. Hey, David. Do you want to unmute yourself? David, we cannot see or hear you, but we do see your hand is up. Okay, maybe we can come back to David. Um, is that, oh, is here that, I am. Oh, you are? Okay, great. All right. <laughs> thank, thank you very much. And thank you for allowing me uh, to, to join you as a panelist as well. As I, I was just, uh, it's a phenomenal meeting. I learned a lot. Yeah. I'm uh, like some of the participants here. I'm new to, to AD, not so new because I have been working on that with, with uh, Otavio Aranquio for a while now with Michelle uh, Ehrlich as well. But uh, I, I wanted to second to another part of Dr. Torch's uh, remarks about uh, models for studying the disease. There are some very exciting in, in vitro culture models that, that can go that far, but eventually we have to show it in a sort of cox fashion in an animal cause, cause and, 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 and the result. And, uh, and I just wonder um, what, what is our thinking about the load mice models? Um, they are being constructed assiduously by, by Jackson and, and individual investigators, Jackson's labs, uh, introducing uh, humanizing individual suspected factors involved in AD. And uh, obviously we want to add infectious agents now to infect those mice. Uh, but there are two, two issues which I wanted to raise very quickly. One is that as far as I understand the, the load models take about two years to wait for symptoms. And, uh, and many, many of my colleagues here are young, but even for young colleagues, two years to wait for a result. And then repeating experiments, which take another two years, it's a long period of time. And sort of parochially, we, we do, uh, we started as, as Eliezer, Dr. Mastia mentioned, uh, we modified HIV that uh, can now infect mice and reproduces a lot of elements of, of disease in people on art, HIV positive people on art, including cognitive impairment or neurocognitive impairment. So we can, we can infect any mouse with this virus. And uh, we can also infect AD model mice. But listening to all of you during the last two days, I, I found myself to be really parochial with HIV because there is so many agents. So as we, I think, agreed just a moment ago, it's a, it's a, there are multiple causes or multiple elements contributing to AD. And we 
talking about infectious agents, there's many of them, and they come from different mechanistic direction and they all contribute in this other way. So it's almost, I almost kind of ask myself, what's the point of studying only HIV or only, let's say, HHV6? Uh, maybe we should kind of try to mingle them in an animal model, and maybe that would facilitate a disease in load mice, so we don't have to wait for two years. Uh, we uh, just, without showing you any data, of course, uh, we uh, succeeded to facilitate some elements of neuropathogenesis in load mice. And that is, we can see, for example, with, with Otavio Ranchio, LTP dysfunction already one month after, even two weeks after HIV infection in mice that are three, four, five months old. Uh, so, so we can speed it up. So in terms of, let's say, hippocampal dysfunction, and we can study it. But it will not take into account, of course, additional contribution of H uh, simplex one, of CMV, or any other agents of bacteria. Um, and, and, I'm, and I'm struggling with this now, because if we have this multi-component disease with this, a lot of factors contributing, uh, there is a wonderful point in focusing on single thing, but how do we do this comprehensive analysis? And that is integrated all together. And um, maybe I think some of this may come from bioinformatics and, and those massive studies we are doing by RNA-seq and proteomics, et cetera, and we can find some pathway. So that's, so that's one way, but I, I'm you know, personally very excited that we can do things with HIV in mice and in context of the AD, and that's, uh, I think, is going to be interesting. Uh, but at the same time, I almost got depressed <laughs> by seeing this variety of factors involved and, and how do we really will integrate it if ever. So that's one point. And the second point, of course, is vaccines and, and, and the way of interventions that we can figure out. And I think that leads very strongly to a microglial cells and perhaps altering that uh, disease causing back to supportive role of microglia, if, if possible. So we have to both investigate the individual mechanisms of individual pathogens, some of them together, hopefully that will speed up disease development in load model mice. And uh, at the same time, we have to somehow think about intervening so we can help people at the present time. And the microglia seem to me uh, uh, thanks. almost critical factor. Yeah, that's, well. you make some very important points, David. Uh, thanks very much for that. Thank you. So, um, uh, so how are we on time, Mac? Uh, we have a plenty of time. Uh, I don't know how strong you are and whether you wish to continue. Um, uh, we have at least half an hour for discussion before we. Um, um, oh, we have 30 more I... minutes for discussion. <laughs> okay, well, we can go on, I guess. <laughs> no, as long as, as as there is ongoing discussion, I I enjoying it very much. Oh, okay, uh, good, good. As long as we're helping if you, if you NIA, to, then we're doing if well. To, if you need to step down, I'll be happy. <laughs> no, 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 this is fine. This to to fine. take over, but I, I mean, I, um, I really, I'm enjoying the discussion and making okay. copious amount of notes here and... Um, I'm happy to continue moderating it. So I think uh, uh, David makes an important point, and that is that, uh, you know, experimentally, you know, why studying a single pathogen makes a lot of sense, but ultimately studying human disease where you got to lump everything together is a big challenge. And, uh, and he worries that if you only study one you know, pathogen, uh, you could be missing um, in the, uh, uh, the big picture, but uh, nonetheless, there must be common mechanisms in all these organisms, and maybe studying one does make a sense. It makes sense that way. So yeah, thanks. Um, okay, so who wants Rachel to... or Jean? Well, I believe um, Dr. Ukraine uh, Steva had her um, <laughs> hand up, and then we have somebody else um, next after that. 
you. Okay, it's a very, very brief comment um, about how we intervene uh, to Alzheimer's right now. Uh, I, I believe uh, we have this sort of vicious circle when weakened immunity increase uh, um, vulnerability of the host and the brain to multiple different pathogens. But uh, um, in turn, uh, these pathogens uh, tap on immune reserves and weaken immunity further. So potentially, uh, I believe these vaccines, they uh, may act uh, intervening um, to this vicious circle and um, on both sides. So uh, there are uh, multiple explanations how they may work uh, producing this off-target or uh, non-specific, aka heterologous effects on immunity. One of this is training uh, macrophages. Uh, yeah. Another is uh, mm, uh, effects on lymphocytes, which are non-specific as well, etc. But all these effects, it's like help both sides and uh, supporting weakened immunity and attenuate this negative effects of infection on these immune reserves. So uh, potentially it might be, even we don't know all the mechanisms, it might be a good place to start uh, uh, these vaccines to enter this vicious circle and at least attenuate these negative consequences. So that's it. That's it. It's just a brief comment. All right. Thank you. Okay. Annalise yeah. Barron, you have your hand up. Uh, yes. Yeah. So I just want to talk a, a bit um, about antimicrobial peptides, also known as host defense peptides, because they're not only directly antimicrobial, but they're also strongly immunomodulatory and affect phenotypes of. Uh, a broad range of white blood cells, including macrophages, dendritic cells, and T cells. So, you know, we, we had the really nice uh, contributions going all the way back to 2011 and much earlier, of course, uh, talking about Dr. Itsaki's work. But in, in terms of antimicrobial peptides, Dr. Imar's and Dr. Tanzi and Moore's work uh, about A beta being an antimicrobial peptide similar to LL37, but just let me mention very quickly about LL37. It's one of a kind in the proteome. It's antiviral, antifungal, antiparasitic, and antibacterial, prevents biofilm formation. Dr. Denise Faustman is running a clinical trial with BCG out of Harvard and seeing that it takes um, about two years after a BCG vaccine injection for uh, euglycemia to be reached in these type one diabetics, but you can then essentially it looks like cure type one diabetes with a BCG, but at, that she just lectured at Stanford in the spring and showed that that coincides with a rapid rise in LL37 expression. And she also extended them to looking at cognitive decline in these older uh, diabetic patients. And she was seeing that at the same time, you know, they, they were seeing cognitive benefit from the BCG injection. And then my lab and two other labs have shown that LL37 directly binds to and prevents fibril formation and neurotoxicity of the A-beta uh, peptide, the IAPP or amylin peptide. And very recently, a group out of Barcelona, uh, Salvador, uh, what's his last name? <laughs> um, it'll come to me in a second, Ventura, I think showed that LL37 is also a nanomolar inhibitor of the fibril formation of alpha synuclein and its neurotoxicity. So that makes three different amyloid forming peptides that LL37 can directly neutralize. And I just want to mention lastly, and then I'll go, is that, you know, macrophages and microglia actually utilize LL37 as do natural killer cells that kill infected cells. They utilize LL37 as the weapon especially natural killers, to kill these pathogens if they're able to internalize them. And then, you know, organisms that are resistant to LL37, relatively resistant, include P. gingivalis because of its gingipane proteases. Chlamydia pneumonia is almost totally resistant to LL37. And in general, um, 
you know, once a biofilm, especially a mixed biofilm, like the lichenoids that David Corey has discovered, once a biofilm is well-established, LO37 can possibly limit growth, but cannot generally eliminate. So that was my, my statement. That's very interesting. So I have a question for you. Is this LL37 derived from the um, uh, BCG vaccine? Is it present in it? Is that what you Oh, think? that's a great question. No, in fact, um, LL37's expression is stimulated by the BCG vaccine, oh. by the presence of the attenuated pathogen. And by the way, oh. you know, BCG is used by intrathecal injection to treat prostate cancer. And it's been proven that it upregulates cathelicidin. There's like at least four papers where they show that BCG upregulates LL37, which is cathelicidin. So I think this is a piece that's missing. Yes, A beta is antimicrobial. Yes, it is. Yes, so is IAPP. But I think there's this seesaw between the expression and, and body's utilization of LL37 and, and A beta and IAPP, um, Melinda, that's not yet being appreciated. Well, that's what I'm doing. No, okay, so, I get it now. All right, thanks very much. Appreciate it. Is that. LL37 immunomodulatory as well, Annalise? Yeah, you know, a group, uh, I'll send you this paper, but they showed that if you have low LL37 expression, and this was identified in the Nod mouse, okay, low LL37 expression leads to pro-diabetogenic, pro-inflammatory phenotypes of macrophages, dendritic cells, B cells, and T cells, if you upregulate it, which you can do simply in mice with a butyrate injection, now all the phenotypes became anti-diabetogenic. And this also explains why females have a higher risk of diabetes and Alzheimer's because naturally and endogenously, females express lower levels of cathelicidin, so they would tend to have more pro-inflammatory mm -hmm. phenotypes. Oh. One thing to add to this discussion, uh, thank you, Annalise, that's incredibly interesting. So in immunology, one of the hot topics right now is something called trained immunity, which it conceptually is basically memory, immune memory exhibited by classically uh, non-memory cells like macrophages and epithelial cells. Anyway, it's, 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 it, part of it is enhanced uh, cathelicidin and other antiprobial peptide production as induced by things like BCG is a well-known inducer of trained immunity, but many different microbial exposures, including microbial ligand exposures can induce trained immunity. And so maybe that bears on some of the discussion that we've had about the connections between some of these exposures and the incidence of Alzheimer's disease. A lot more work obviously needs to get done. That's interesting. So then you would say that infections are good um, because they're going to train your immunity. Yes, yeah, um, some, some infections are good. <laughs> some are not. You can see it either way you want. <laughs> can I uh, add a little bit to this? Actually, yeah, it's, I agree with, with both Dr. Corey and, and Byron. It's uh, training innate immunity. That's actually what we are referring to, right? And I think that harks back to Dr. Tanzi's concept that innate immunity plays positive, highly positive role initially, and then it's it got, goes off rails, right? Later and and actually contributes to disease. Now, if we could reverse it to to train innate immunity, which is a general general tool, right? It's not antigen specific, so it will tackle number of viruses. And I, I just wanted to mention that Dr. Potash in our, in our department recently published a paper where we're just treating mice with poly-IC, uh, increasing innate immunity this way, actually reversed cognitive disease in mice caused by, by um, uh, in mice caused by echo-HIV. So, so it is, uh, it's extremely powerful when you can reverse cognitive impairment by increasing innate immune responses. And, uh, and the, the big question now is, uh, as, as Dr. Corey mentioned, there is memory, uh, recent work from Harvard, right? Memory uh, resides by epi epigenetic mechanism, mechanism in uh, microglia and macrophages. So, so one can really train those cells. Um, uh, to remember. So I think immunity uh, of using innate immunity as a tool could be a, a quite general, perhaps blunt tool, at least uh, to start. And uh, it can be modeled in animals pretty easy. 
I, that's also very interesting. I mean, innate, you make a good point about innate immunity, uh, but all the same, if you consider microglial cells and macrophages in the brain as part of the innate immune system, then chronic activation of those have uh, been linked with neurodegeneration. So, and yeah. also, and we know that HIV turns it off, right? Yeah. But, yeah. but you can overcome it actually by having more of it and training yeah. the, the, mic the microglia to respond. Good. Can, okay. can we allow Dr. Niki Schultek to, to, to ask the question? Hi. Can everyone hear me? Yes, we can hear you well. Wonderful. So first of all, I'm not a doctor, so I'll preface with that. Uh, but I am the founder of a global research consortium that's been looking at this exact issue for the last four years, also investigating the role of chronic infection and asthma. Um, so I wanted to make a comment, first of all, um, amazing presentations throughout the last two days. They literally have my mind racing and, you know, thinking up ideas as far as collaborations and ways that we can kind of really pull together these disparate puzzle pieces, which is what it really seems like, right? A thousand puzzle pieces scattered about, how do we address it? One of the things I wanted to mention um, was something that was raised and it's just this issue of fulfilling Koch's postulates. And it seems that the pathogens themselves have really outsmarted us in many ways. You know, They can uh, employ various mechanisms to either hide, duck away from the immune system, uh, avoid antimicrobial therapy. Also, typically some of the pathogens that we've been talking about the last few days, um, they may wax and wane and change over a course of time. So, so really the thing that we have to think about is how do we go about um, resolving these issues? And one of the things that was raised yesterday was this concept of treatment. And I wanted to talk a little bit about another area of medicine and sort of piece together these silos. So if a patient has um, a pneumonia and it doesn't respond to typical course of macrolide antibiotics, and then the patient gets admitted to the hospital, continues to decline, infectious disease specialists and pulmonologists are going to, I'm gonna borrow Ben's word from yesterday, they're going to interrogate what's going on in that patient. And as we know, with pneumonias, you can have viral drivers, bacterial, fungal pneumonia, particularly in immunocompromised patients. You can even have a chemical pneumonia from inhalation. So that really gets to this concept of detective work. So one thing that I wanna to suggest to the field to think about is interrogating uh, live patients that have various stages of Alzheimer's disease, or whether we would examine patients with mild cognitive impairment, um, and then possibly begin to figure out what pathogens are on board in those patients. One example of a test that's leveraged if a patient has um, a refractory pneumonia in the hospital could be cell-free DNA next-gen sequencing, you know, where you would simply send some plasma out to a laboratory or it can be done in-house at certain academic centers, you know, to really find out what's going on in that individual patient. There is a possibility too, as was alluded, that, that this could be a polymicrobial situation. So I just wanted to posit that because a lot of the trials that have been done looking at anti-infective agents in Alzheimer's disease whether they're antibiotics or antivirals, typically have a rather narrow approach where you're including patients that either have evidence of uh, you know, one single pathogen and then you're giving them all the same intervention. I just wanted to kind of posit that thought process of examining it a bit more like an infectious disease approach where we would be detectives. All right, thanks for that comment. Um... I think that's worthy of some thought and discussion. Okay, um, who do we have next? I believe that Dr. Waterhouse wanted to make a comment. Okay, and Mac, I'm gonna to have to excuse myself for a couple of minutes and I'll be right back, okay, I'm sorry. Okay, great. All right, sorry. I mean, it is probably a uh, time for us to, to start wrapping up our conversation, uh, uh, but, but go ahead, I, I, I'll take over. Oh, can I Thank make it? Thank you a very much. All right, appreciate it. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm sorry. Um, yeah. Um, thank you so much. This has been just a wonderful workshop, and um, I just wanted to say that um, I became severely ill with a neuroinflammatory condition 
Um, it was a severe case of myalgic encephalomyelitis chronic fatigue syndrome. And a lot of people don't know how severe it can be. There are many people who are bedridden and on feeding tubes for many years. And after many years and failed treatment approaches, I was finally able to recover because of new research on food hypersensitivity reactions and a new type of test for them. And the test arose out of reports that food hypersensitivity reactions can cause stress and increase the heart rate. And I was posting in the Q&A a lot of studies that suggest that adverse food reactions might be involved in Alzheimer's disease. Um, interestingly, food hypersensitivity reactions appear to be important in irritable bowel syndrome and attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. And both of these conditions have recently been linked to a greater incidence of Alzheimer's. And with food hypersensitivity reactions potentially causing stress, and as we know, stress can increase susceptibility to infections and, and viral reactivation, and it can disrupt sleep and, and of course sleep problems can affect Alzheimer's. So anyway, my main point is that our company is developing an app based on the test that I mentioned. And this new app will make it much easier to use the heart rate data from wearable devices to detect stress provoking food reactions that could contribute to symptoms and pathology. And my company plans to explore whether the use of this app can help lead to improvement in a number of different chronic conditions, including Alzheimer's. In my view, this type of data could provide a missing piece of the puzzle. And we're looking for collaborations and funding, and, and I'd love to hear comments and questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Waterhouse. Um, obviously, um, you perhaps should contact uh, program staff at NIH because there are funding set up, uh, for companies to develop um, this sort of technology. So uh, I'll be happy to perhaps talk to you or connect to connect you. Um, any other questions? Rachel, Ajin. Yeah, so, so there was one that was put in the chat um, saying, given such a diverse range of microbe and some contradictory results, will a data-driven objective assessment of the presence of microbes in AD brain compared to normal ones from all the available sequencing data be an important thing to do? Who would like to take a stop at this question? Dr. Redhead, perhaps? <laughs> I don't know. Can, sure. can, you repeat, can you repeat the question? Uh, given such a diverse range of microbes and some contradictory results, will a data-driven objective assessment of the presence of microbes in AD brain compared to normal ones from all the available sequencing data be an important thing to do? Well, well, it is being done, Mac. This is Steve. Yeah, that's exactly what I think. I mean, you know, and we all, I mean, I showed you yesterday 6,000 brains that we've looked at, okay? And you could look at 50,000 brains. And again, I could tell you on um, doing kind of genome-wide um, analysis for, again, a disease that I'm interested in, multiple sclerosis, you look at the first 100 patients, you don't find something. The first 10,000 patients, now you find actually genes when it pops up for 100,000 patients. So really numbers are an important driver of this, particularly particularly if you're looking at heterogeneous disease, right? So yeah. if the clinicians could more or less bin these patients, whether you've been exposed to an agent or um, you have some reactivity to, uh, to some uh, bacteria, then you may be able to you know, get data that's associated with those subsets. But uh, to, the, to the, the question in the, in the chat, uh, I think it's clearly being done, and, and I'm not a big genome lab, but it's being done, you heard from uh, uh, the Broad, they're doing uh, a lot of work on this as well. So I think there's data to be gotten from that, but as Rudy said, you know, we're, we're looking at end stage, right? This is the end of it. If you could get us early brains that, you know, you know, or, or biopsies, you know, we, we, in MS, we could actually do get some biopsies. They've been very informative, but uh, uh, we're doing the best, you know, we have with uh, the available resources we can, we can get. 
I think um, Steve. Steve's absolutely right there. Uh, you know, end stage is a it's, it's it's only a unique set of challenges. Uh, I mean, I think reprocessing the data is good. There's a lot of choices you can make in the computational algorithms, and you know, different eyes on the same data will you learn different lessons. Um, I, and I think there's also a role for different sorts of data, including uh, uh, kind of more targeted sequencing, in maybe a more hypothesis driven way. Uh, and and I think looking further and further upstream in the you know in the in the AD in, in the evolution of AD, look at subjects with mild cognitive impairment, looking at subjects with high neuropathology but perhaps no dementia. Uh, you know, I think I, I think I think there's a lot of ways we can kind of expand the the, the analysis that would be productive. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Ben. I see the uh, Dr. Corey has his hand up, and Dr. Itzaki, Dr. Corey first. Go ahead. Sure, uh, just to add to this very interesting discussion. So uh, doing uh, detailed sequencing uh, with cohorts, et cetera, is being proposed. I think it's a great idea, but but there's, I, I like, like to propose there's probably a better way of moving forward. The problem with sequencing, as powerful as the technique is, it lacks sensitivity. So for example, in a mouse brain that's full of Canada albicans, um, you can sequence until the day is long uh, with a highly experienced metagenomics lab and you're never gonna find the DNA. So it, it's the only way to find that Canada is actually to culture it. So a better way moving forward is I'm not saying that Canada is the only cause of Alzheimer's disease. Um, there could be many different contributing pathogens. I think the best way moving forward is to combine the sequencing approach of whole brain and possibly other tissues with a culture-based uh, micro, uh, uh, microbiology-based approach, including the sequencing of pathogens that you actually culture on whatever media. Great, thank you for that comment. Dr. Itzaki, please go ahead. Thank you. I think comparing the frequency, prevalence, or even the quantity of um, a, a microbe in comparing normal and AD brains isn't necessarily that useful because in, in the case, for example, of tuberculosis, I think uh, about 10 times more people have the bacterium in their body but don't get TB. I mean, about, in other words, putting it the other way, about only one tenth of those who harbor the uh, mycobacter um, tuberculosis actually develop tuberculosis. So the presence of a microbe doesn't necessarily mean it has any action. As I keep saying, it's whether or not it causes symptoms is another very important point. And probably what is the determining factor is the host genetics as with APOE and HSV1, where we found when we looked for virus in brain those 30 years ago, we found it present in both normal and Alzheimer brain. And the difference seemed to be from our later work, the presence of APOE4 together with the virus in brain. So I think quantity or prevalence alone are just not adequate tests of whether something matters or not. Thank you, Dr. Itzaki. <laughs> Maria, go ahead. All right, great. Um, so, you know, we're, when we're looking at um, doing these large screenings and we're finding all these multiple pathogens that can potentially contribute to Alzheimer's, it's hard to determine funding priorities, right? Like which, which pathogen should we pursue? So I'm speculating, is there any way that um, we can rank uh, the pathogens in order of levels of evidence like we do in medicine that um, there's been some type of animal studies that have supported um, a role of that pathogen contributing to AD pathologies. Importantly, in our hundreds of years of medicine, are there any case reports that, or case series that that pathogen can even produce a dementia clinically, right? We don't have animal models, but we have human history. You know, we see, you know, as Avindra was saying, okay, well, HIV patients were developing you know, there's case reports that they developed dementia at a higher frequency and that inspired those, um, those studies. And then are there larger scale epidemiological studies that can uh, support that uh, pathogen as, uh, or providing more evidence that that pathogen uh, plays a role. So I'm just speculating there when we see so many things, so many potential pathogens being thrown out there we, because we can discover hundreds, you know, how would we decide which ones to pursue? So I would say, you know, is there an evidence-based way that we can rank which ones we should pursue? 
Great comment, Maria. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Cox. Um, I just wanted to, to go back to this idea of uh, reanalyzing the data and really trying to find a, a target through the noise. Um, Maria, also, I love that comment about, you know, rank based, uh, what's what microbes sh should we go after in sort of a differential diagnosis. But one thing I think that we should try to bake into our current studies is writing in um, things like uh, permission to do chart follow up. Uh, over the next five years in our subjects or the ability to go back and get bio, uh, blood for biomarker studies. One of the big problems, of course, is the slow nature of Alzheimer's disease. And so if you're comparing your uh, age matched healthy controls to Alzheimer's subjects, what if somebody's just about at that tipping point where they're going to, uh, in the next year, become symptomatic? Well, if they become symptomatic in the next year, probably some of the pathology was already starting. Uh, and so being able to go back and re-stratify your patients that were in the very earliest stages of Alzheimer's disease might um, completely change how we actually define which bacteria are up in, in AD versus healthy controls. And, and I think there's a lot of new exciting technologies uh, and that could just be a consideration uh, going forward as, as we try to um, really build consensus uh, in, in our data. Okay, Chris, go ahead. I think there were some other people who had raised their hand first, but just a quick comment on this question of finding a common thread. So I do a lot of work in the spinal cord injury research field. And one of the challenges there has been, how do you parse out animal model readouts and compare them to prospective clinical milestones for translation to the clinic? And what has been helpful is for you know, people in the field to come together and, and agree on certain phenotypes, requirements, experimental parameters, et cetera. I don't know, especially since everything's going here towards the prodrome and the early stages of Alzheimer's for the experimentalists who want to go into animal models, would it be useful for a working group to come up with such a set of criteria that may not have to be ranked, but that are you know, staged and that will help those who are applying to search for new mechanisms they don't have to argue every time the whole nine yards of why this might be an interesting phenotype or not, and they can use that as a reference point. So this is more like a, a lookup table that will help facilitate research and not have it shut down based on, you know, everybody's preference for a certain pathogen or a certain mechanism or, so this is just a bird's eye uh, comment and I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Karen. Hi, yes, uh, kind of to piggyback off of what everyone's been saying, I think uh, one major um, concept that seems to unite us is that the, the thing that seems to be the most efficacious in preventing this would be a prophylactic strategy, whether it's viral or bacterial or fungal. Um, the the take home from, from all of our perspectives is that prophylactic treatment is, is so far essentially the only thing that can really prevent this sort of infection-induced Alzheimer's. So maybe there needs to be a bigger focus on communicating that message, maybe doing um, more efforts to do, you know, prospective studies or randomized controls trials in which we, you know, we focus on these antimicrobial treatments as a strategy to, to mitigate future Alzheimer's disease. And, and because it's, um, you know, it, it is such a unique message, I think we have to really put forward that idea as a, as a possibility for clinical trials and, and other related studies. Great, thank you for your comments. Uh, unfortunately, this is a very exciting discussion. Unfortunately, we have to, to start wrapping up our meeting. So perhaps uh, last comment from our panelists, um, if any, otherwise I would like to express my sincere gratitude to all of you to all of you who agreed to present chair session chairs, all of you who join us yesterday and today ask questions and patiently wait. Uh, that, that's, that's amazing conversation. I have so much notes. I would like to thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Eliezer Masleach and Brad Wise and all my colleagues in Division of Neuroscience for their support. A, a, and really very special thank you to Rachel Sare. Jean Tion Collar and Liz Newman, who, who basically organized and managed this event. 
And obviously, thank you so much for Aaron Arne and, and, and the whole NIA team for their super uh, technical support. So um, again, perhaps last comments, if any, otherwise, I would like um, to ask Dr. Maslia to for a sentence or two of closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Mac. And again, really great, great uh, meeting. I uh, want well, thank you. Thank also all the speakers, uh, Rachel, Jean, Lise, Rao, but uh, and all the chairs, uh, really fantastic meeting. And I think, as you said, we're gonna go back, uh, have a lot of meetings internally, try to digest all the information. We're also gonna try to put together some sort of like a white paper or uh, conclusions as to what are the gaps and uh, opportunities coming out of these meetings and uh, probably come back to you. I mean, I think one thing that we also learned from uh, these couple of very exciting provocative days is that um, there are a lot of people interested in the field, many coming out of the Alzheimer field that really would like to contribute. And um, I think we would uh, wanna think about uh, uh, how to create the, the opportunities for more people from outside of the Alzheimer field to come on board and uh, contribute. And also maybe think about what would be the follow-up to this meeting uh, where we could have um, a venue where many of you that wanted to present your work or share your, your work would be able to do so. Um, uh, I mean, a lot of... Uh, uh, a lot of things to think about also. I mean, we had this funding opportunity uh, uh, or a couple that we, I, I mentioned. And um, I mean, we need to think about in the future, how are we gonna go about it? Uh, how we can open more doors, uh, issues of review how, have always been a problem. I mean, for example, with this specific funding opportunity that we had, we were very emphatic that we wanted to have a special emphasis panel with people that really understand the topic. Uh, but, you know, we often get this issue with reviewers that uh, they tend to be someone down on, on, on some of these topics. So um, we're definitely something that we will continue to work and we really appreciate all your comments and uh, information and uh, just want to re reinforce that we're really committed to um, uh, help develop the field and uh, open the doors. And I mean, Mac has been doing an absolutely amazing job uh, along with all, all the others at, at NIA. So um, thank you. Thank you everyone again and uh, hope to see you again soon. <laughs> thank you, Eliezer. <laughs> uh, thank you so much everyone. Uh, again, you if you wish to comment, the last chance. Okay, hearing none, again, thank you so much. Uh, we will be digesting that material. There's a lot of things to digest and, and hopefully we'll, we will keep in touch. So thank you, thank you, thank you so much for your uh, participation and uh, good afternoon, good night and hope we will keep in touch. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.